Okay, good to go. All right, well, good morning, Joint Judiciary uh, Committee. This is the second day of our last meeting of the interim, Tuesday, October 27th. It's good to see all of you here. I think this is a very special meeting for uh, much of our Joint Judiciary Committee. As this committee knows, uh, four of our members will not be joining us um, in the next session to carry some of these bills forward. So a special day as we acknowledge um, Representative Pelkey, Senator Von Flader, and Representative Ponell and our good co-chairman Kirkbride this day. I hope you stick with me through the end of the day. Hope to um, acknowledge the service that these four fine legislators have done um, throughout their careers here with us, but to acknowledge this is their final action of, of this particular committee. So thank you for being with us through to the very end and we appreciate you and appreciate um, your presence here today. It's been an honor serving with all of you. I appreciate it. I've been on judiciary ever since I got elected and uh, it's, a, it's an important committee and I feel that we've done a lot of good work over the years. Thank you, Representative Pelkey. I think our schedule, as most of you know, today and um, or yesterday and today should be fairly manageable for us to get through. So I'm hopeful by the end we can share some thoughts and comments about our four colleagues. Um, so hang with me to, to the end. There'll be another item on our agenda just for us. So thank you so much. Uh, we don't, we'll dispense with roll call. It looks like everyone is present. Um, We'll go ahead and start with the judiciary updates. Do we have Chief Justice, or do we have the Honorable Justice Michael K. Davis with us? We have Chief Justice Fox might be around as well. I see him. Good morning, Justice Davis. And I see Judge Wilking there as well. Justice Davis, we are prepared to proceed with hearing any of your updates you would like to provide us. Sounds like you're on mute right now. How about that? Loud and clear. Thank you, Chief. All right. Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, uh, Mr. Co-Chairman, members of the committee. I'm uh, <clears throat> Mike Davis, and I have the honor of, as, of serving as Chief Justice of the Wyoming Supreme Court. Thank you for the opportunity to provide you with a Wyoming Judiciary Update. Uh, present by Zoom, I hope, this morning are Judge Catherine Wilking, Chair of the District Judges Conference, and Judge Brian Christensen, who is President, I think maybe President for Life, of the Circuit Judge Conference. Uh, Lily Sharp, our Court Administrator, is also participating by Zoom and other members of court administration are monitoring the proceedings uh, to provide information to us if needed. If it pleases the chair and the committee, uh, we interpreted uh, the time that we have this morning as being set aside to provide updates on uh, things that might be useful to the committee. Uh, and uh, we have had contact with the committee in May and August, and I'll try not to repeat what was said then. I would propose to speak briefly on these topics, CARES Act funding and expenditures, how the process has worked for the judiciary and the difficulties encountered and overcome. As part of that, the amount of uh, usage of teams for hearings and uh, meetings since the pandemic. Teams is the video conferencing app that we use instead of Zoom. Uh, thir third, changes to the rules of civil procedure to provide for email filing until true electronic filing can be put in place. Uh, progress in rolling out full court enterprise, which is a case management system in the circuit courts. Uh, we're uh, reaching a milestone of completion with that. Also the pending implementation of that same program in the district courts and an update on electronic filing and other progress toward digital courts. Uh, the last topic we thought might be of interest was uh, court operations in the pandemic at uh, all levels. And I plan to report on Supreme Court operations and Judges Wilking and Christensen will report on operations in the district and circuit courts. And I suspect you'll find uh, their reports very interesting. Uh, so if I may, I would proceed. I note that there is some time reserved for introduction of bill drafts. I'm not sure what those are. I think we had a full and fair opportunity to address uh, issues of the set me free 
uh, statute and district court budgeting and also uh, the uh, weighted workload issues, uh, but I could certainly touch on them if that's before the committee. And so uh, if you approve, uh, Madam Chairman, I would just plunge into discussing the CARES Act. <clears throat> yes, Chief Justice, that's fine. Um, the, the bills concerning the district court and the uh, review of um, judicial workload, the committee chose to table those particular items. So committee, for your understanding, if you um, would like to take one of those issues up on your own initiative, um, this next session as an individual legislator, you certainly may do that. Um, and Chief Justice, go ahead and uh, we, we would be pleased to hear how that CARES Act funding is working for the courts. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. In a uh, financially dark time, the availability of CARES Act funding has been a, a bright spot for the judiciary. We had an advantage going into the crisis that many other states did not have because we already had technology that allowed our judges to keep operating remotely uh, when the virus hit. In other words, they were able, our trial judges were able to continue to hold hearings um, e even though their courthouses were basically closed. <clears throat> but uh, we needed more network tools to deal with increased traffic from the trial courts and employees working at home at all levels. And the trial judges needed more tools to allow them to safely conduct proceedings that have to be done in persons. So here's some examples uh, and, and judges uh, Wilking and Christensen can talk about this more specifically, but we needed to separate uh, people within courtrooms with more microphones and more monitors. We didn't want people passing microphones back and forth. We didn't want them sitting right next to each other, which is something that happens, for example, in juvenile proceedings all the time because there are a lot of uh, people involved in those. Uh, we needed better means of uh, displaying exhibits uh, electronically so that paper exhibits were not being passed around um, uh, with the risk of uh, transmitting coronavirus. So more document cameras, uh, sometimes called ELMOs, and monitors were needed so that exhibits could be seen by everyone without touching them. Uh, proceedings, uh, as you're probably realizing with these, uh, have to uh, often be partly in person and partly remote meaning that monitors and cameras are needed for those in the courtroom and to display those in the courtroom to those participating remotely. Um, juries have been a particular issue uh, and juries may have to be split into different rooms because jury rooms are so small and we can allow them to communicate with each other from different rooms with, by surface hubs. All of our courthouses are different uh, since they're built by the counties and so the needs vary uh, from court to court. Um, there's also the question of the digital divide, uh, as it's called. Many poorer citizens have no means to participate uh, remotely in proceedings, not even a paid uh, four minutes uh, cell phone. So we had to find a way to get them some way to participate without injecting them into full courtrooms. And uh, we uh, searched uh, for a solution which involved, <coughs> excuse me, computers or tablets in separate rooms or iPads if we could get them, and they're very hard to get. There are more needs, and we can provide you the list we submitted for the funds uh, we received if you're interested. So the, the first step toward getting those funds was to figure out what was needed, specifically, uh, which meant meeting with the judges on our courtroom technology committee, uh, and of course the uh, chairs of the uh, conferences to find out what they thought they needed. We also had to have our IT and other staff determine what was necessary by way of network infrastructure to support the heightened level of remote activity and to address any security threats that come out of that. Then our small IT staff had to draw up technical specifications for the equipment needed, price it, and negotiate for the best deal they could get. And all of that had to be put into a written CARES Act request by our chief financial officer, Claire Smith and her staff. The requests were then reviewed by the governor's office and then closely reviewed uh, for compliance with the CARES Act requirements by the attorney general's office. This may have been a little bit unusual in terms of separation of powers, but it's almost like we were at war. So uh, that issue did not come up and we're not complaining. Uh, we made a number of CARES Act requests since June. In the first round of requests approved by the governor on June 24th, we received $6.2 million for courtroom technology and jury adaptation. 
These funds were not enough to complete the upgrades in all courtrooms, so we made a second round of requests for additional funds. In October, on October 6th, the governor approved an additional $4.2 million to complete the remaining courtrooms. So from June 24th, 2020, the race was on because that money needs to be spent by December 31 of this year, as you all know. Then our IT staff and general counsel had to draft contracts with attached specifications for each courtroom for work to be performed by our contractor. And there are 30 of those contracts, some encompassing more than uh, one courtroom. Uh, the contracts were completed as the time to do the work approach. And at last, and lastly, the IT staff had to work with the courts to find time when courtrooms were not in use so that the contractor could do the work without disrupting hearings. We have all of the details of this and would be happy to provide and, uh, and discuss them, but here's a general description of work that's been done in the few months since the money became available. 34 courtrooms and 23 jury rooms have been completed around the state. One courtroom and one jury room are in progress in Lusk. Upgrades are scheduled for all the courtrooms in Wheatland, Cody, Powell, and Laramie. <coughs> Excuse me, that leaves nine others to be completed. <coughs> If time allows, there are two more we'd like to get to, Laramie and Pinedale, but those are in pretty good shape if we can't get to them by uh, December 31. I would just like to say getting that much work done and scheduled is a remarkable achievement since the five member IT staff led by Greg Goddard and with the help of our chief fiscal officer and our general counsel, Lisa Butler, were able to do all this while still performing all of their regular duties, obviously by working longer and harder than we probably have any right to expect them to do. If you're interested in knowing what this technology means on the ground to the trial judges, I would suggest that you ask judges Wilking and Christensen, whose courtrooms have been upgraded when they speak to you about their court operations. Uh, before I pause, uh, I would just want to, I want to give you some idea of the use the Teams, Microsoft Hub and other devices have been getting just in the last 90 days. So that'd be from the end of August. Users have logged 885,559 hours of audio time on the system. You can phone into the system um, much as you can phone into Zoom and participate if you don't have a video device. There have been 769,695 hours of video time for those who had that capability. There have been 63,965 hours of screen sharing meaning that documents, et cetera, were displayed for hearings. So I envision that being used for exhibits in remote hearings. Uh, we could never have imagined this level of usage before the crisis. Um, and that has increased our limited IT staff's workload to maintain the equipment necessary to allow this to help users and to iron out problems. But they, they get it all done by working harder. There's also no way to know uh, how many potential exposures to the coronavirus were avoided by the use of this technology to the court staff, attorneys, litigants, uh, and the public, but one would think a lot. And once again, Judges Wilking and Christensen can speak to the changes, the uses they make of this technology and, and how the upgrades have helped them if they have. Uh, should I pause there, Madam Chairman, for questions on CARES Act, because I'm ready to move to the next thing. Sure, any questions, Senator Anselmi Dalton? Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Chief Justice Davis. I understand the sprint. I mean, I've been doing the CARES Act funding for my businesses, and it's a, a killer, you know, gathering all this paperwork, buying the stuff in time to get it under the deadline, getting it in place, you know, has been a killer. We bought a lot of stuff. I don't know if you bought, I was just curious, you know, if we, I know there's another round of funding that opened yesterday. Obviously, I haven't looked to see what that applies to, but I was curious. We bought casting equipment for, um, say our projectors and we bought wraps for our doors, nanoseptic wraps, and we bought mouse pads that are washable. And And I didn't know if you guys, if, they, if you looked at any of those kind of items so that, you know, we had less touch in our motels as well. And I was just kind of curious if you picked up some of those kind of technologies for your yourself as well. Thank you. Justin. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, Senator and Selmy Dalton, um, we did expend a good chunk of those funds. I didn't mention it for personal protective equipment, cleaning supplies, et cetera. Uh, and we have a CARES Act requests for things which um, we, we think will help us with that. 
Uh, for example, our screening at the door of the Supreme Court, when we're, we're able to let the public in, um, it, we need to separate that out and have a more accurate screening process there. And so we requested some CARES Act funding. And I can't honestly remember if we got that, but we have looked at a number of things uh, like that uh, and uh, did spend, uh, I think, $300,000 out of the first um, uh, burst of funding for personal protective equipment, et cetera, for the trial courts uh, more than us. Hope that answers your question. All right, please continue, Chief Justice. All right, uh, the last time we were here, the committee passed a bill requiring e-filing and uh, setting some requirement, excuse me, email filing, uh, and not to be confused with electronic filing, and setting some requirements, uh, and that's a done deal. I'm not here to address that decision. But at that time, uh, the clerks of district court were already looking at rules for email filing until true electronic filing uh, comes online. And they were, so they were ahead of the curve. And we talked about this a little bit um, in August. Um, and I think we promised you, or I promised you that we'd get something out in terms of rules. Uh, anyway, the clerks worked closely with the civil division of the permanent rules committee our court almost always, except in emergencies, works through committees composed of people who will have to work with the subject matter of any rules we change and who know how change will affect them, which is what happened in this case. The civil division of the uh, Permanent Rules Committee is made up of seven, seven members of the Wyoming State Bar, seven lawyers, three judges, two lay members, one clerk of district court, and one Supreme Court justice who chairs the committee, that happens to be Justice Fox. The concerns that had to be addressed uh, based on the, uh, the clerk's uh, operational requirements were reliability of the documents that were coming through email. In other words, are these really being filed by someone who uh, should be filing them? Payment of required fees and things like acceptable signatures. Uh, and amendments were arrived at to the rules uh, by a collaborative process between the clerks and the rest of the committee. The amendments were recommended by, for approval uh, by the Supreme Court, by that committee and the Board of Judicial Policy and Administration, which if you're not familiar with it, is composed of judges from all levels of the court system. The court adopted the rules without a, uh, objection um, uh, on October 6th and they will be effective on December 7th. And I believe we have provided the committee a copy of those rules. Um, we believe the rules are a fair accommodation of the interests of the bar and the clerks of court uh, at both levels, circuit and district. They are just a stopgap measure until e electronic filing can be brought online, at which time they will be outdated and no longer uh, important. And I think that's all I had to say at this point, although I could certainly answer questions, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Chief Justice. Any questions for the Chief Justice about that amended rule? I know it's a, a dollar per page. Is that right, Chief Justice? That's correct. You know? Representative Stith. Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, I will take the bait on this one. Let me uh, add, make sure I understand the rule. If I file by email under this new rule and I attach a 27 page document to my email, is my fee $28 for hitting the send button? I think so. Uh, Ms. Madam Chairman, Representative Stith, I believe that's probably right. Representative Stith? So as a short follow-up, Mr. Chief Justice, let's imagine that instead of you being the Chief Justice, presenting this as a rule to us, the Joint Judiciary Committee, let's imagine you were the director of the product development department at Apple and you presented this to Steve Jobs. How do you think that proposal would be received? I, uh, Madam Chairman, Representative Stith, I have no idea. I just have to tell you this about that process though. The, the clerks, when they receive this document, have all the issues that I've previously described. And, and, and in addition to that, they print the document. So basically, if I'm, uh, I don't know about Steve Jobs, but if I was back practicing law with Yonke and Toner, 
um, I would be shifting the cost of printing those documents to the clerks of district court, handling it, collating it, putting it together, all of that time that is spent, uh, which is a, a great convenience, would be a great convenience to my law office. Uh, and then the clerks pick that up. So it, it's an unfunded mandate. I would point out there's always been a $1 charge for fax filings. I would also point out the way that it initially was without a fee was that at the beginning of this process, um, our uh, Justice Fox and I and court administration met with Dr. Uh, Alexia Harris and her crew. Um, Dr. Harris is the state epidemiologist. And at that time, we were told uh, that at that time it was believed masks were not going to be very helpful. Even if you had an N95, you would probably put it on wrong. Um, and um, that uh, there was a great risk of contagion from touching documents. Um, and uh, over time, those things have proven not to be true. I know there's debate about this, but masks are, uh, we're told, help, and uh, the risk of transmission is not so great. But at any rate, back then, in those dark days, we, the Supreme Court, working with the um, conferences, said we're going to suggest to the clerks of district court that they take email filings, and we're going to suggest uh, that they not charge. Uh, because we need to keep those people out of the courthouses at all costs uh, because it's contagious. Did we have authority to do that? I seriously doubt it. And we get back then to the statute that, that you proposed a bill to uh, repeal uh, Representative Stith. Uh, but the, the clerks of district court, um, we find if um, what we propose to them is reasonable. If we listen to their concerns, they'll do it. And so they did do it without charge. And frankly, that was abused quite a bit at the time. And eventually, in a committee that's dominated by attorneys, there was an agreement that this uh, was fair for them to receive the $1 per page uh, fee for email filing, which is a convenience. And I'd say it would have been very convenient to me in years past before there was electronic filing in the federal courts because I have on occasion chartered an aircraft to get a brief or a filing to um, Cheyenne or Denver and that costs a lot more than a buck a page, I can tell you. So um, it was, I think it was a fair accommodation of all of those interested. And um, I would just say this, finally, uh, could we improve this in some way that cut out the printing? I don't know, but it's not worth the effort. Um, it's just not worth it because e email filing is a dead end. We need to get to electronic filing and we are under contract for a system which is absolutely state of the art if we can just get it rolled out. So I, I'm pretty sure I didn't exactly answer your question, but uh, that's what I have. Additional questions for the chief? Uh, Chairman, another time. I, I just note that um, Representative Jennings and Senator Koss both have their blue hands up. Great. I saw Representative Jennings. All right. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Uh, Representative Jennings? Madam Chairman, my question uh, goes back to the other part, um, his first part of the presentation. Would you rather take Senator Koss first, maybe, on, on what was more current? Uh, sure. Well, th questions on the e-filing, e Senator Cost. I can't see Senator Cost. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, my question for uh, Chief Justice Davis is, if you didn't have to print those and you could put them in a uh, cloud bank storage, such as iCloud or some, something like that, where you could file, um, you could have folders for each of the individuals under the each district court or whatever, it seems like you could save a fairly substantial amount of money to these different uh, filings and they'd still be available to everybody rather than having to print all that out. Uh, is that just not an option? It, 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 uh, Madam Chairman, uh, Senator Cost, I, I think that we could come up with some technical way to do this thing differently, but it would cost money and it would take time of our limited IT staff. And if you compare that to the possibility of swiftly getting to actual electronic filing, um, I mean, if you look at the system that we're looking at, there won't be any need for anybody to copy or manage documents at all. They will go into the system with limited clerk review electronically, and they'll be checked 
uh, to make sure that there's no viruses or other things that could contaminate it. When those documents <clears throat> go into the system with email filing, there'll be a notice of service sent out to everybody on the case electronically. So no more mailing of that. Um, the system we have actually will collect the filing fees uh, and they're even going to offer an opportunity, uh, the system we're looking at, uh, they're even going to offer an opportunity to law firms who don't like to use credit cards to have a charge account. So a lawyer files a case, the charge, the, uh, uh, that's noted in the record and file and serve express will pay the clerk of court that very day and carry the debt and, and collect it from the lawyer later. And uh, finally, um, if you're thinking uh, e email filing may be, uh, or e-filing, true electronic filing may be free. I, I know, uh, I don't know if co-chairman, uh, Chairman Nethercott is a Colorado uh, attorney or not, but this system uh, has a feature that will be of great interest to your colleagues on uh, joint appropriations. And that is you can hit each filing for whatever you want. And I understand in Colorado, you can't file a thing. So I guess what I'm saying to you is it's a dead end to spend any time on email filing. We just need to get to that high tech system that we need. We'll eventually have a case management system, a public access system, and the lawyers involved in the cases will be able to access every document they have electronically. And in fact, Pile and Serve Express has an option that the lawyers can use it as their office case management system. So I hope that answered your questions. Question. Chief Justice, just as a quick reminder, when will lawyers be able to e-file in the district courts in this state? That's a uh, topic that I was coming to for the next issue. Uh, and I can hit it now if you'd like, or I plan to come back and talk about it later in conjunction with some of the other things. So your, your choice, Madam Chairman. Well, I guess Chief Justice, the question really is how long will the e-filing or the email filing question be of relevance to the state of Wyoming before the e-filing system will be operational? So how long will this effort be of concern? One, two, three, four, five years or? Where are we at with that? How, how big of an issue should it be? I sure hope it, Madam Chairman, I sure hope it won't take that long. Um, the, uh, with regard to the district courts, the first step we have to do is to get the case management system rolled out. And the good news I was gonna give you is that the circuit court system, which is another issue is done next month. So we can focus on the district courts. And uh, there's work been done to get that case management system ready to go. So, uh, and they're already test migrating uh, to the district court system with the case management system. Um, and the, um, the uh, that we expect to be doing by June to uh, begin migrating data to the new case management system. Originally, the clerks of district court had told us, we don't want you to, and they are the custodians of the records. We don't want you to do anything with e-filing until every single district court is on the um, uh, case management system that we're gonna use full court enterprise. Now, I think uh, perhaps because of the burden of email filing, I believe they're gonna be willing to consider that. And we're gonna reach a point where we can start rolling out the case management system and then in that court, come back within a period of time that we think um, the clerks are comfortable with it. So I think we're gonna start seeing a move up. And I would hope we begin to see some kind of e-filing by maybe the end of 2022 in some courts, the pilot courts at least. There's more to be said about that. Uh, so the email filing may linger longer in some places than in others, but I suspect we will have uh, um, the, the clerks of district court enthusiastic about email filing, uh, excuse me, electronic filing, I keep mixing them up, uh, as uh, a means of uh, avoiding, the, uh, avoiding that uh, process of dealing with the emails. Any final questions on this topic for the Chief Justice? Representative Jennings, did you wanna go back to your question before we get too far afield of it? 
I'd like to, Madam Chairman, if I could. Uh, Chief Justice, thanks for being here this morning. I have three questions circling back, back to the CARES um, money that's being spent. And, and um, I, I know you might not be the person to answer all of these, but uh, did those funds, the CARES funds, lower some of the state's obligations? Because it seems like some of that would be double duty. Um, you know, maybe not the hand sanitizer, but some of the video or the uh, digital stuff. And uh, if they did, I mean, because we've been attempting to fund a lot of that for a number of years, how much of that do you see is actually covering um, the state's thing projects that we were doing? Can you put together something that would tell us, you know, it looks like we might have some savings here. So that would be two. And then um, something that I'm sure that you're sensitive to, but I, I hear very, very little talk about it. What about the problems of the human element? We're doing Zoom. I've been very um, unhappy and vocal about the fact that we've, we have lobbyists and we have uh, bureaucracy, but we have very, very little of the citizenry. So I'm sure there's got to be some level of frustration. Are you guys looking at that? I mean, there's people who just don't want to do Zoom or, or video. Uh, there's got to be a, some human element that is damaged by the direction that we've headed with all this. Is there some some way that you guys are, are I guess, comfort me a little bit and tell me that you're looking at that aspect also? Those would be my three questions, Chief Justice. Madam Chairman, Representative Jennings, I jotted them down and I hope I got them right. Um, we had, uh, we went through a period of time uh, in the last session where we were seeking funding for electronic filing, which is always a high priority uh, replacement of our own Supreme Court electronic filing case management system, which has been in place for 12 years, et cetera. And one of the directions that came to us from the legislature at that time before the coronavirus was you should not spend any money on uh, this uh, courtroom technology, the video, et cetera. Fortunately, we already had some when the coronavirus hit. So uh, the encouragement we had by statute, I think it's a footnote says, don't spend any money on this. And so the CARES Act was um, basically, in my mind, an addition. I'm not an accountant, um, so I don't know how to address that. We did not have plans to uh, go to the kinds of things that we got um, through the CARES Act funding because you would normally, why would you have a whole bunch of microphones around a courtroom? Um, you would have one at a podium and then probably one at each council table. And now we've got a lot more uh, because of the fear of the virus. And so this was a change in the whole operation. So I, I don't think it reduced it. Uh, can we tell how much? I, I could certainly ask our uh, people to figure that out, but I don't think there's any significant um, reduction. With regard to the human element, uh, yes, that's a big deal. I mean, uh, some of our courts have pushed off up to 50% of their jury trials. And we're talking criminal jury trials, which are under a, uh, a requirement, uh, a 180 day trial requirement from the date of arraignment or the date the defendant pleads. And um, so uh, not only is there a need for a human element, there's a constitutional requirement that we bring in jurors and that the, the history of how we have moved was we started off with um, orders uh, issued from the Supreme Court, which were in the form of recommendations because we don't, as Representative Stith's uh, uh, discussion of his legislation on the set me free statute pointed out, we really can't tell the district courts what to do, but they tended to show common sense. And so we basically just didn't know anything and shut everybody out of the courthouse. Over time, though, in June, we went to a program whereby the, the judges would uh, open up and begin to have more in-person proceedings with safeguards in place so that they could have people in the courtrooms and um, to a greater extent. And, and the courtrooms were never totally empty. I mean, the, the, there were always uh, criminal cases where the prosecutor came down the hall and was socially distanced. Uh, maybe the defendant and his attorney were in the jail remotely participating. Uh, there were always those kinds of things. And then in August, 
uh, the district courts and circuit courts began to experiment with uh, uh, jury trials. And there have been a number of those. Uh, and of course, they have all been in person. We have not tried to do uh, video jury trials. I think that's hopeless myself. I think you're going to have to have in-person jury trials. And the best person to tell you about that and the true impact or the best people to tell you that are probably Judge uh, Wilking and uh, Judge Christensen. And if, if I may, I would ask them to sort of make a note that that question is something uh, that uh, the committee's interested in and address it. Chief Justice, why don't we just have them come on now if they can, uh, Judge Wilking and Judge Christensen, if you're listening, if you share with your video and, and your mics and Good to see your faces this morning. Welcome. So the question, just to remind you, um, is how are you conducting hearings within your courtrooms uh, in light of the, the pandemic? Uh, well, I, I will start, uh, Chairman Scott, if you don't mind. Uh, and uh, Representative Jennings, I appreciate the question uh, because the, uh, the personal element is, uh, is important to all. Uh, the judiciary. Um, as far as how we are conducting uh, jury trials, uh, those did begin uh, in August, and uh, those were um, resumed as long as a judge in a courthouse had an operating plan uh, that was developed uh, by them and approved by local health officials. Uh, and I believe that the majority of those plans are on the Supreme Court uh, website under the COVID uh, tab. Uh, and so I've been incredibly impressed with the citizens uh, of the state of Wyoming. Uh, we have summoned them in for jury duty and they come. Uh, and we do our level best to protect them. And I think they're very appreciative uh, of our efforts I can tell you in Natrona County, uh, we do require everyone in the courtroom uh, to wear masks. So the judge has a mask, the attorneys do, uh, and all of the jurors do. Uh, the jury now sits in the audience portion uh, of the courtroom. They are not in the jury box and they are socially distanced uh, in the audience portion of the courtroom. Uh, here we have really uncomfortable wooden benches uh, for the audience, so we did um, have to purchase some cushions uh, for the jurors to sit there all day long. Um, they deliberate in a separate jury um, area, which is actually one of our courtrooms. Uh, so we've secured another courtroom, uh, and the ladies and gentlemen of the jury are uh, in that room when we're on breaks and also when they're deliberating so that they can maintain social distancing. Uh, within the courtrooms, uh, we have microphone covers that are switched out uh, every time somebody, uh, a new witness comes and has to use that microphone. Um, we have, uh, with the technology that Justice Davis was speaking of, we now have uh, earpieces and microphones uh, that allow us to have bench conferences without anyone leaving uh, council table or their seats. Uh, the way that works is I hit a little button uh, that projects out some white noise, which is quite loud, um, but the judge, the attorneys, and you know the defendant or whoever else needs to be a part of that bench conference, which normally would have you know four or five people right up here uh, at the bench with me. Uh, instead, we have a special audio channel uh, that only we can hear. Uh, and so we're able to have a conversation uh, while we're socially distanced. The court reporter can transcribe everything that's being said, um, but we don't have to leave our seats. Uh, and uh, we conduct the jury trials uh, through the use of these uh, Microsoft Surface hubs, um, display monitors uh, and equipment that have been put in the courtrooms. Uh, so that we don't have any uh, exchange hand-to-hand -hand of documents. Uh, to address uh, Senator Anselmi Dalton's question about casting, um, the technology that we have does allow for an attorney to cast immediately from their 
laptop, whatever image they have on their laptop can be cast, um, you know, touchlessly uh, to a Microsoft hub, and that can be displayed to the entire uh, jury and uh, parties. Uh, so that's been very helpful. Um, so really, that's how we're conducting uh, jury trials, and I can get into some more detail about that, um, Chairman Nethercott, when I uh, give my comments, but uh, let Judge Christensen speak if I missed something. Judge Christensen, thank you, Judge Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Co-Chairman Kirkbride, and members of the Joint Judiciary Committee. I'm Brian Christensen, Circuit Court Judge of Natrona County and President of the Circuit Court Judges Conference. Um, specifically, Madam Chair, to uh, Representative Jennings' question. Um, we have not excluded, we deal with a lot of pro se individuals, uh, self-represented litigants in circuit court, small claims, uh, evictions, protection orders. Um, there was a time where we required our landlords and our FEDs to appear by video or telephone. Uh, we haven't, we've kind of gone away from that now. They can appear if they like, but they have, some of them have continued to do that. That's been very convenient for them. We never know who's going to show on a lot of these civil hearings. Um, and it's hard to track down even when somebody has been served with a document on a service address that may not be a mailing address. So it's hard to get them information. And even if you get it in the service document uh, that uh, we'd like you to call in or appear by hub, that information isn't always uh, seen on the documents. Um, they might uh, fortunately look at the date and the time that uh, they're supposed to show up for court and appear for that. So we just never knew who was coming to court or not. We never excluded anybody out of the court if they showed up on those type of uh, hearings, um, including citations, um, again, citations don't have telephone numbers, mailing addresses. Those addresses are based on driver's license information that the law enforcement fills out, and that's not always up to date. So uh, as I stated, we just never knew who was coming, and we were prepared for them to show up in person. Uh, uh, there was a time we would have them uh, maybe call in from the uh, parking lot if they showed up, but that's n uh, no longer we due to our um, concerns with the uh, COVID related issues and we've set up our courts for social distancing and mask wearing and masks are available to all the participants uh, that do show up in our courts. So um, we, we have uh, not limited those but a lot of individuals and parties have taken advantage of uh, appearing by uh, uh, video or telephone and especially our petitioners and protection orders. I think that's been uh, welcome for them. However, I will say if it is a, a contested hearing that uh, it's hard to um, have one party try to ask questions or cross examine in those type of situations, we'd rather have them in person and set those hearings up for uh, uh, COVID protected um, uh, manners in which we conduct our proceedings. So we will try to accommodate that and have those as contested hearings in court if, uh, and we haven't had a problem doing that. And I think that's pretty much the, uh, the way it's been going around the state as well. Um, I know, it, like I said, at some point though, back in June and July, we were um, requiring some of those civil hearings to be held over telephone or video um, in, uh, access into our courts. Um, as to uh, our, our um, protocols and, and policies for jury trials, we have a jury trial going on right now. I was informed we had one juror refuse to uh, wear the mask, so they were excused and we'll have to discuss if we're gonna bring them in on or show cause or what. But that's been very rare um, and talking to the district court judges here as well, we rarely see that, that there's been a pushback or um, concern about the protocols and, and rules that we have in place for conducting jury trials. Judge Wilking. Um, thank you very much, um, Madam uh, Chair. I, I did want to address Representative Jennings' uh, question a little bit um, with regard to the personal element. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples, uh, sir. 
I had a sentencing um, several months ago uh, on a horrible kidnapping case. And we did conduct that sentencing using Microsoft Teams. Um, the defendant was in jail in Converse County. So he appeared from that location. Um, the father of the victim was deployed overseas. And so he uh, was appearing obviously remotely and the mother was here in Casper. We were all set up in this um, format. And, um, you know, it was, it was difficult uh, to conduct a sentencing um, that way. Uh, and, you know, there was a lot of emotion um, that I don't think was really being conveyed effectively uh, to me. Uh, but the family felt very strongly that they wanted the father to be able to participate. At that time, we didn't have the surface hubs up and running. Um, today, um, if that situation arose, we could have the father on the surface hub with the family members and all parties present in the courtroom and he could participate. Um, I conducted another sentencing on a horrible shooting um, shortly thereafter and everyone was in the courtroom. And I will share with you that was, um, it was more meaningful, I think, to me as the judge and I think to the hearing participants to be physically present in the courtroom. Um, we cannot sentence an individual by electronic means unless they consent to that, uh, nor can we conduct a change of plea hearing uh, without them consenting to doing that in person. So. For those that we do online, uh, the defendant has consented uh, to that. Um, you know, we have had participants from um, Department of Corrections facilities, so Torrington, Rollins, uh, they're able to participate um, electronically without having to be transported, which I think is an incredible um, savings uh, to the state. I know locally our jail is very appreciative that for mass arraignments, things like that. They don't have to transport everyone to the physical courthouse. I think it's a bit of a mixed bag and I think we'll navigate that as we move forward. Um, as an example of how I think it works really well, um, I've never had better participation in my child support hearings uh, than I have had through these electronic means. It is so much easier for the parties to appear this way um, for a very short hearing. So a child support hearing can maybe only take 10 minutes sometimes. It's much easier for say a mother who's got some young children at home to pop on the computer for those 10 minutes. She doesn't have to get daycare coverage or bring the children to the courthouse. It's also easier for say a father who has a child support obligation and is working out of town to get permission to you know, pop out for 10 minutes and um, take a call uh, in his truck and then be able to go back to work. So um, the personal element, I think we're trying to figure out what is the best fit for that. Uh, but uh, I think we have a lot of opportunities uh, with this technology to, to get that right. Uh, so I hope that helps answer that question. Thank you, Judge. Um, follow up from Representative Jennings, and then we'll get to Representative Pelkey. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And it, it is, I, I appreciate all the information that you guys have given here. So I, I only wanted to touch on, uh, as a follow up, just a little bit to the, the technology and stuff. I, I get it. I get the why we have to do it. I get that there's some real savings there at times. There's other things. But kind of the personal aspect to it and one or part of the human part that I'd just like to hear a little bit from one of you a little bit is that, you know, when that person's in front of you, you get to read body language, you get to, you get to see a lot of things. And, and just overall, I understand that we're in a, a technological, we're trying to solve some human problems with technology, but I'm just not, I'm just not sure I'm hearing I'm, it, it easier is not always better. And sometimes uh, I worry that we might become so reliant to the technology and the savings and stuff like that, that sometimes maybe we miss some of the, some of the mandate there of the human element that you have the right to face your accuser and um, 
maybe we should rewrite that. You have the right to face screen your, or Zoom meet your accusers or things like that. It, and so I just, you know, as, as a judge, when I look at that, if I were in that position, those things, the entire shift would concern me in certain evo- uh, levels of that human part. So as individuals, does that concern you? And I guess that's my follow-up, Madam Chairman. Thank, thank you, Representative Jennings. I, I think I've heard you testify pretty well to that, um, Judge Wilking and Judge Christensen, and including Justice Davis. But any more thoughts on, on those concerns about the human element and the confrontation clause? Judge okay. Christensen, you're muted. Yep. I'm right. Am I on? Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, yeah, I'll take a shot at that. Contested hearings are always better, I think, in person. A lot of our technology and the use of uh, hearings we're talking about are not uh, uh, contested. They're not um, even on a forcible entry and detainer. A lot of our people, either it's to now uh, show up with their uh, CDC affidavits or um, uh, it, it's or they agree or they've moved out or um, you know so it's same with protection orders they're going to stipulate to the protection order um, as to uh, um, small claims uh, I'm trying to think I don't think we've done a small claims on video or telephone we've, we've had those in person and uh, when you get to a contested trial those are as Judge Wilking said are held in person so um, and I saw Representative Pelkey's hand up, but I just was thinking about him uh, uh, talking about when he had a hearing and he was in Laramie and the judge was in uh, Fremont County and the defendant in, incarcerated and the prosecutor in another site. When you're doing uh, motion hearings that only last a half hour instead of having individuals drive uh, for those type of hearings, um, and they may just be uh, uh, pro forma type of hearings, um, it saves a lot of, lot of time. And in fact, I had, I was covering a trial in Rollins and my defense attorney was in Laramie and uh, it was a Rollins prosecutor and myself and Casper, we did everything but the jury trial and over uh, our uh, teams and, and uh, Zoom uh, accesses, which uh, saved everybody a lot of, of uh, um, time and, and could be involved in other hearings throughout the day instead of travel time. But, um, uh, but when it got to contested hearings, uh, those would be preferable and we are trying, if not, uh, throughout the state, I think almost all those are being held in person with the judge and the parties. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Judge Christensen. Representative Pelkey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. And this is a question uh, for all three judges, particularly uh, district and uh, circuit. Uh, since the pandemic has affected our processes, I'm just curious as to what percentage of hearings you've had. And, and again, I, I mean, you probably don't have hard data, but if you could ballpark it, what percentage of hearings have you had via Microsoft Teams versus live court appearances? And uh, uh, have you noticed a significant difference between those? Judge Wilking, I believe you answered that question as well, generally, but uh, we'll, we'll try that again. Judge Christensen, if you can ballpark a number of, um, I'm sure that's a moving target as well, but if you can. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Pelkey. Uh, the, the significant one has been jail arraignments, new arrests. Um, uh, every circuit court, to my knowledge, is now doing those arraignments by uh, uh, video uh, teams, so we call it, um, with video arraignments. And uh, that has uh, been, I think, has been uh, very well received by the judges. Some of our judges were a little skeptical of it first, but because of the technology, we're able to see the individual in, you know, in a big screen uh, right there asking questions for setting bonds um, and initial appearances. And uh, those have been, everybody that's utilized those have been uh, uh, 
widely, if not unanimously, uh, been accepted and uh, received well. Um, as to uh, the numbers of hearings, that's the big one. And all, that just took a whole plate off because we, we have quite a few of those every, every day uh, here in Natrona County. Um, but as to use otherwise, I think I would say most of our hearings are now, uh, um, well, I couldn't say that with our civil hearings, summary judgments, those things like that, or telephone or teams as well. Um, there's the, it just depends on the day and what type of hearings you have uh, set in front of you. But, um, and like I said, we just never know with our pro se litigants who's going to be here in person. If they've contacted us ahead of time, we've told them they can appear by uh, video or telephone. Um, so it just depends. It's just hit and miss. But uh, it's, a, it, of course, it's been a significant increase uh, than what we were doing as the chief has uh, stated uh, before the pandemic. Representative Pelkey. Yeah, I'm curious again, uh, how much, so the pandemic, I mean, Spanish flu in 1918 eventually passed. Uh, this pandemic will eventually pass, hopefully with a vaccine. How much of the, uh, the new efficiencies uh, <clears throat> do you believe may carry through post pandemic and uh, how are they going to, in the long term, affect uh, uh, what we do in court, either by video or, or in person? Judges, either one. I uh, have another cut. Uh, Representative Pelkey, I'm glad that you said that, that this will, this will end. Uh, I don't think that among our conference, it's anybody's preference that we conduct these uh, criminal matters, particularly domestic cases, that we would do those electronically. Um, I would think once the need um, to keep everyone, you know, distance has passed, that the hope would be we could transition back to doing business as usual. Uh, I think, though, um, you know, with the new technology in place, let's say in the medical malpractice case or something like that, there could be really effective use of the technology for say expert witnesses that are in another state to testify uh, and to, to have kind of maybe a hybrid use of, of the technology. Um, I agree with uh, Representative Jennings and, and your comments. It, I do want to have the people in front of me so that you can pick up on those nonverbal cues. Uh, so, I don't believe members of our conference believe this is how it's going to be uh, from here on out. Um, we would like to have everybody back in the courtroom for uh, all of the proceedings, just as we have before. Uh, but I, I do think it'll be utilized uh, in uh, maybe some novel ways uh, once the pandemic is over. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Judge, Judge Christensen, Christensen, do you like to ask answer that? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Pelkey. Um, I don't see the video arraignments going away. I think uh, it has been very efficient and effective in setting bonds and reviewing for initial appearances. Uh, I think we're going to continue with uh, the ability um, dealing with, uh, you know, we did beforehand. We allowed uh, telephone calls in, but now we can do it by video of, of uh uh, civil attorneys from other cities calling in on summary judgment cases or um, uh, default hearings, anything that might come up um, other than the contested trial. Um, and also in criminal hearings, uh, we've allowed individuals uh, in, in uh, living in Douglas or Cheyenne to appear by video um, upon their request. So I don't see that where we wouldn't have done that a year ago. Uh, I don't see that going away. Um, and especially in the winter when it's easier and somebody says, I can't get there because the road's closed. Well, we have the ability to have you here now uh, yeah. for arraignment or a, a hearing that wouldn't be a, a contested trial. Follow up Representative Pelkey. And then let's try to move on from this. 
I, I'll move on quickly. I just want to make a comment. I mean, a, a couple of weeks ago, I appeared in Laramie Municipal Court, Albany County Circuit Court, Laramie County Circuit Court, and uh, Carbon County Circuit Court within a period of 2.5 hours. And obviously, under under the old status quo, I would never have been able to do that. So I, I, I'm actually appreciating that the courts have adjusted as quickly as they have to allow that kind of uh, uh, work. All right, thank you. Okay, back to you, Chief Justice Davis. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I think uh, we're at uh, progress in getting to digital courts and we've already touched on this uh, and I've spoken about it many times. Uh, we're all desperate to get to e-filing, particularly in the district courts, um, but it's a complicated process, particularly with the small application staff that our budget permits. But anyway, I'm gonna talk about district courts for a little bit, although we already touched on it, if I may, in a minute, but I first need to touch on the almost completed circuit court update. Just as we were beginning to realize that we needed uh, a different case management system in the district courts than we had. The system in the circuit courts reached end of life in about 2016. There was absolutely nothing wrong with this system. It worked except the manufacturer wouldn't maintain it anymore and there weren't gonna be any upgrades. And that was full court without the enterprise. The enterprise is the new system uh, and it worked very well for the circuit courts. Uh, the circuit courts have about 125,000 cases filed a year. Many of those are traffic tickets, uh, I grant you, but we really can't afford to have a system that would fail in the face of that kind of a caseload. So it was kind of important to deal with that. So our IT staff began a process of upgrading uh, that circuit court system to the new version of the same uh, program, which is a lot more complicated than just plugging in an upgrade to maybe something like uh, uh, Office uh, for Word. That process will be complete in November uh, after pretty extraordinary efforts uh, by our small IT application staff since 2018. And here's what the process involved and here's what it's gonna involve on the district court side. Every one of these programs has to be customized to deal with the kinds of cases the legislature assigned to a particular court, in this case, the circuit court. And that is a tedious process involving the clerks, our small IT application staff and the vendor. And then it all has to be tested after it's customized for the kinds of cases. So for example, we have forcible entry and detainer cases in the circuit courts. We have uh, domestic violence protection. We have stalking. Uh, those kind of cases have to fit and they, Basically our staff and the clerks, uh, certain clerks of the circuit court go through it step at a time to uh, find any bugs before it's deployed. Then when it's ready for deployment, the data, which is massive, has to be moved from uh, the old system to the new system, one uh, court at a time, uh, beginning with pilot courts. And then the pilot courts use the system for a while to detect any further glitches, which this, of course, means training the clerks of court to run the program, which takes hours of our staff's time. Um, one of the things that we have learned is that uh, as much as we like the vendor for this product, our people need to work with the clerks of court on migration and training. Um, the vendor has uh, not only told us that no one does it better than Wyoming, but it also evidently has told other states where the program is being rolled out our staff compiled a comprehensive uh, 300 plus page manual for this process. And recently Montana asked for it saying uh, that they were going to the file and serve express program. And, and they said, uh, and, the, and the vendor said that Montana could benefit. And of course we shared uh, that information. Our IT and applications staffs together consist of 18 people if all our positions are filled. And as many as nine of those are working on network issues uh, and database issues. We have a huge database that requires constant tending, um, which leaves a potential nine positions to work on applications projects like this under the uh, leadership of Heather Kenworthy. However, we've been only, right now we have only six of those positions filled. They're hard to fill. 
Um, you need people with the right qualifications and they're hard to find, uh, but they're in, we're in progress, we're interviewing, uh, and uh, hopefully we can hire somebody good. Um, so right now, the, on the circuit courts, the program's adapted, it's been migrated in all but one county, which will be done next month. And then, um, and everything's brought online, but that one county. Each court uh, requires 80 hours of the application team's time. So imagine the impact on a small staff and imagine the travel because they actually have to go to uh, the location to uh, migrate the data. And that's not all. Uh, nobody learns how to use these programs as well as they need to with just the initial training. So follow-up uh, has to be done. And the plan for that, at least before the pandemic, was to bring the clerks to Cheyenne, where we have a training facility in the Herschler building. Uh, and that's still something we plan for, although uh, some uh, circuit court clerks who would have to be trained aren't really eager to travel right now. And if you've seen the mostly red map of Wyoming, I think you can understand why. Um, bottom line is that except for the ongoing training, our small staff can now put that sort of behind us. We'll still have to provide a help desk to answer questions and so forth uh, on the new program. But it's, it's basically rolled out as of next month at the circuit court level. So then the district court and the case management system, the case management system bores everybody. And frankly, I'm bored talking about it, but it's the equivalent of what, what happens when you take a pleading to the court, you have a, a file clerk who comes, takes that paper, stamps it, uh, puts it in a file where it can be found. So when you come back later and wanna see that document, you know what case it is, you go find it. Um, that's what it does. But anyway, the, the case management system went, has gone through the same process of getting it ready for district courts. <clears throat> and it's going to be ready to roll out. The, the date for piloting that in, I think it's three courts, is July of 2021. So we can start getting that piloted. And it'll be more complicated than the circuit courts because the district courts have more case types. Um, and as I said earlier, we're hoping that after the district uh, court clerks are on that system for a while, starting with the pilot courts, we can start putting e-filing in there. Um, uh, and I'll talk a minute, a moment about e-filing. Uh, we had a uh, committee uh, composed of uh, those who use e-filing, included attorneys uh, who have expertise in electronic filing, happened to include the current president of the uh, Wyoming State Bar, um, and court personnel, um, lots of others who looked at it. And uh, the, the program that was chosen was File and Serve Express. Uh, it was highly recommended from states where it is uh, rolled out and in use and has been in use. And we were delighted to find out that the case management people, Justice Systems International, and the um, File and Serve Express had developed a relationship sometime while we were going through this process. So they're already working to coordinate those programs. And um, so efforts are underway to, to get that ready to go uh, sooner maybe than we had hoped. I mean, I always keep hoping it's gonna be sooner and we shall see. Uh, originally, as I mentioned earlier, the clerks of district court were insistent that we not roll out e-filing anywhere until every single district court had its case management system up. And I think they were afraid of that because the Y user system tended to be different. That's the current uh, case management system everywhere and had different problems. But I think maybe they're now willing to consider um, letting us ease out the e-filing system incrementally. Uh, and we will undoubtedly have the same small application staff to do all of this, but we hope that our contractor File and Serve Express will be able to help us by at least doing part of the rollout. So knowing that, I'm starting to see a little light at the end of the tunnel here after some a dark kind of journey uh, through it started, which for me started almost as soon as I got on the, the Supreme Court. Um, I was assigned to this by uh, Chief Justice Kite. But uh, so there's always a, what can go wrong next uh, on this? And I can tell you there are some things on the 
that are a threat. Um, if we would lose the $2 million appropriation for e-filing that we have, or if it was cut uh, in the budget cuts in this next uh, session, um, we wouldn't have the money to pay for file and serve express. We're under contract, but of course we have an escape clause if we don't have the funds and uh, we wouldn't be able to pay for it. And I, I hope that this is such a high priority for um, uh, legislators that that won't be cut in the process of uh, the budget uh, issues we have now. Another thing that would kill us is if personnel cuts reduced the size of our IT and application staff. Um, President Perkins suggested before the last session that we retain an independent consultant to look at what we're doing and study our planned efforts to get to electronic courts. So we worked through the uh, National Center for State Courts and wound up uh, having a recommendation from um, Maryland, state of Maryland uh, court administrator that we use a, an outfit called Justice Management Institute. They did a study, cost us a lot of money, and they said we're on the right track, um, but we have a very ambitious schedule. And it also concluded that we were eight people short to meet the deadlines we'd set for ourselves, much less speed it up. So let's face it, we're not gonna get eight more people. We're gonna be lucky to keep the people we have and to be able to fill the positions that are vacant. But if we would lose any IT uh, or applications people we have, uh, that would impact the timeline further. Um, so if there are other questions on that topic, I'm about to uh, leave it, uh, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Chief Justice. We do have some questions. Um, I'm, I'm gonna lead the conversation and tie in your conversation now with, you indicated the legislature had told you, um, and I recall being part of those conversations about stop investing in the courtrooms for technology and instead use the fund created to get e-filing and the e-filing system underway. And really we were talking about the court automation fee, is that right? Madam Chairman, at least in part, that's that's true. And for a refresher for this committee, um, can you just share the history of the court automation fee and what it currently is? <clears throat> Madam Chairman, I hope so. I may have to have you pick that up with uh, Lily and her people later because it's changed so much. But back around 2000, the legislature passed a bill which created a $10 at the time Justice, Justice Systems Automation Fund, which was to contribute to the funding of the very kinds of things we're talking about today. What began to happen though after that, and I, I don't, I'm sure it happened with the court's consent and the legislature's uh, consent, but one of the things that happened is that the IT uh, salaries began to be paid out of the Justice Systems account and so ultimately we wound up at some point with 13 of these employees I've been talking about paid out of that account, which didn't leave much for actually investing. And so we went through a process, uh, seems to me a few years ago, I think I was I led that effort to upgrade courtrooms uh, because we had a study which indicated ours were in pretty bad shape, uh, not just in terms of uh, audio visual, but like wiring was bad. and. There were all kinds of problems um, and the fee was bumped to $25 per case. And that would apply to everything from speeding to first degree murder to all civil cases. And then within the last session, there was another increase uh, which was uh, up to, um, I think it was an additional $15. So we're up to $40, I believe, or maybe 45 as a result of that. And I think a lot of that was driven by the Joint Appropriations Committee uh, feeling that we needed to get funds to be generated by the users of the uh, courts and um, to defray some of these uh, expenses that we, we had sought. We tried to persuade Joint Appropriations to let us move the 13 positions to the general fund. That, that went over like a lead balloon in Joint Appropriations and uh, went nowhere. But anyway, that's that's the history of this and somewhere in this process uh, with regard to the justice systems account the the uh, <clears throat> suggestion was and I, th I really think it's in a footnote or even in the bill it says this should be your lowest priority to do courtroom 
technology. And I, I can't uh, fault that at the time because we didn't have a pandemic going. So uh, Chief, that's the way I... Chief Justice, can you just help? I, I was always co confused by the decision to take that court automation funding and go invest it in, say, the Niobrara County Courthouse for new technology, recognizing that not a lot of jury trials are happening in that particular courtroom. But we've heard testimony in this committee about the district court judges, that is their domain. Those are actually county courthouses. And so um, help me understand how the Supreme Court is appropriating funds out of that fund um, in our county courthouses when virtually the Supreme Court has no supervisory control over those locations anyway. Well, actually that relates to another statute that was passed in this process with the concern over the court technology. At one time, the statutes read, and I don't have it in front of me because I wasn't expecting the question, that um, the, uh, the county shall provide a quote unquote suitable courtroom, whatever that meant. And some of them uh, provided great courtrooms with electronic equipment, uh, uh, Gillette, Campbell County is a great example, Sublet County is another great example, but the other courts were neglected. And, um, Regardless of the use, I mean, if a murder trial is venued in Lusk, that's where the trial has to take place. But the, uh, the balance that was struck in a new statute said, okay, counties, your job is to provide the wiring to the walls. And Supreme Court, here's some funding that you're going to take, and you will provide the electronics that are needed for a modern courtroom. And so... Um, it left that in that situation. And of course, there's always a question of what can be, what we can do in a courtroom uh, because some of these courtrooms are historic, like the one in Kimmer is a great example. I don't know if that's Elizabethan or whatever it is, architecture, but then the, uh, uh, the, the, there's a certainly a strong local desire to not have a bunch of ugly equipment on the walls. And so memoranda of understanding is reached on wiring and so forth. But the reason we're doing this is because the legislation says that's what that part of the JSA fund was to be used for at the time. And um, that's the balance struck between us and the counties. Thank you, Chief Justice. Yeah, I, I, um, that's all been recent in the last four years. I, I, I do believe I think this committee has uh, address a number of those issues we've discussed. Thank you for that recap. Representative Gray. Yeah, I've got a couple questions. One on the email filing and then one on the backlog. Is now a good time? Uh, represent, hold that question. Representative Jennings, do you have a question on this topic? Madam Chairman, mine also has to do with the email file and just a clarification. Well, let's address those two now. So we'll go back to Representative Jennings or Representative Gray. Okay, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, so my question, I'll ask the one on the email filing because we're transitioning into that. So I was reading the rule here uh, the other day and uh, this 50 page cap, I, I'm, uh, that was a little perplexing to me that you have to call the, the clerk if it's over 50 pages and get permission. What, what's the reason for that? And, and why would, uh, would a clerk reject that? I mean, I, I was a little confused by that. Thank you. Chief uh, Madam Chairman, Representative Gray, um, as I indicated earlier, these are an accommodation reached by this uh, committee uh, um, as to the interests of the clerks and the interests of the attorneys, um, not so much the interest of the judges because that's not an issue. I can only speculate that if it's more than 50 pages, that all has to be printed collated and so forth and they just want a little notice at the uh, at the district court clerk's office but I don't think we have a clerk lined out today for to discuss that or um, I don't think Justice Fox is scheduled uh, or on the call and she chairs that committee so that's about all I can offer you is a little speculation there Representative Gray. Representative Jennings would you like to ask your question on the same topic? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Chief Justice, mine is uh, similar to that, just needed a little bit of clarification for me. 
in the rule change, it says a dollar per page to transmit or receive. But in the other, in the front part of some of that um, explanation, it says um, choosing to have the clerks print their email documents. So would that be that they would be charged a dollar for sending that to them and then a dollar if they wanted to have it printed and then maybe a third dollar if they want it sent back? <laughs> Can you, uh, can you, uh, Ma Madam Chairman, uh, Representative Jennings, can you direct me to the language you're speaking of? <clears throat> Madam Chairman? Yes, Representative. Yeah, in the, um, well, I think it's in most of them, at the uh, rule four, it says fee for electronic transmissions. And um, it's talking about, you know, the in facsimiles before the clerk shall charge a dollar per page to transmit or receive. But then when we had uh, the correction to the state bar news release, the uh, part of that under there says uh, parties choosing to have the court clerks print their email documents will be charged. And oh, so I'm curious of which, how far that goes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Madam, Ch Madam Chairman, Representative Jennings, <clears throat> I think that's a broad statement. If you choose to email file, you are effect in effect requiring that the clerk of court print those documents. That's the only thing that can happen now. So uh, that's why the press release says that. You don't have to email file. You can uh, send it by FedEx. You can um, mail it, although that's a bad idea in this day and age. You never know when it'll show up. But um, if you choose that, you have chosen to shift the cost of printing that document if you send it by email uh, to the clerk and, and that's why the payment is required to my understanding of the thinking of the uh, civil rules committee. Representative Stith. <clears throat> Madam Chairman, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, to, to follow up on the same question I think from Representative Jennings, and I, and I had not noticed this before, but in rule four, if the clerk transmits an email to me and attaches a 30 page document does the clerk charge shall charge a dollar per page to hit the send key to email me a 30 page document do i have to pay 31 dollars if the clerk chooses to email me uh, madam chairman representative stith <clears throat> i don't know um, I'm not sure how that works. That'd be a good question for the clerks of court. I kind of envisioned that being the clerk might perhaps email the first page of a document with a file stamp so that you knew that it was filed. But um, uh, I don't know how that would be used or how it would come into play. <clears throat> Any other questions for the Chief Justice on this topic? And then we'll go back to Representative Gray. Representative Gray. Yeah, I do want to ask Representative Stith really quick. Uh, what, what are you seeing there? I'm not this this issue of the where's the language in Rule Four. Representative Stith. You're on mute, Representative Stith. Madam Chairman, I apologize. Uh, Representative Gray, the amended language of Rule 4, as I'm reading it, states as follows. The clerk shall charge $1 per page to transmit or receive an electronic transmission, including facsimile or email. And so what I had not appreciated before was that this appears to create a mandatory requirement that the clerk shall charge $1 to transmit an email, which would mean literally that by its plain language, I think that if the clerk chooses to email me a 30 page document, I get charged $31 for that, I guess, which seems counterintuitive. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chairman, could I, could I ask a question again? Thank Please. you. Um, uh, Chief Justice uh, Davis, I, the status of the backlog, I don't think we've covered that. You know, if, I don't know if we need to bring in the district or the circuit courts, if, in each level, I mean, what, what's the status of the backlog? Um, I was coming, uh, Madam Chairman, Representative Gray, I was going to 
talk to you about the Supreme Court uh, situation, but uh, really that question, I think you're probably talking about the trial courts um, and you would be better off to ask them um, how they're standing. And I think uh, the, the the Judge Christensen and Judge Wilking are probably far better positioned to discuss that than I am. Let's bring them back on board, Judge Christensen and Judge Wilking, if you were listening. Wonderful. And those questions are uh, about the backlog in your courtrooms as a result of kind of stalling out during the pandemic. Uh, Chairman Nethercutt, uh, Representative Gray, um, it's an interesting uh, idea uh, that, that there's an incredible backlog uh, within the district courts. The district courts have been open and have been operating um, throughout the pandemic. We've been doing all of our hearings or the majority of them through electronic means, uh, but child support matters, juvenile court, criminal matters, except for jury trials, um, divorce cases, all of that has continued uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, you know, the jury trials were halted for a short period of time, um, but as of August, uh, as long as there was an operating plan in place, the district courts across the state have been conducting uh, jury trials and uh, there was an informal survey uh, of our conference asking, you know, what trials do you have scheduled? How many have you done? And the general consensus is that we are um, doing quite well. Very few judges have speedy trial problems with their criminal stacks. Um, once uh, the parties figured out that jury trials were actually going to be held, uh, they did start to work the cases a little more closely. And so you had a lot of cases that were resolved uh, through plea negotiations. Uh, we have civil trials that are set uh, and ready to go. Uh, so, you know, there was a little bit of catch up on the jury trial side of things. Uh, but to my knowledge, there is not a significant backlog uh, within the district court conference. Judge Christensen. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Gray. Uh, I'd have the same uh, reflection. Uh, we were operational throughout the pandemic, held at what we call a docket calls, uh, trial status on our jury trials, um, made our attorneys still talk uh, with each other to uh, attempt to come to a resolution on those cases. And they did uh, above and beyond <laughs> getting those resolved. Um, we've had, uh, our stacks do not look uh, overwhelmingly uh, backlogged and very few speedy trial um, issues. And I think they were pretty much all the ones that we did have some concerns on have already been resolved. And uh, I think that was because we were still operational during the pandemic. We had civil collection order to show cause cases, uh, which were the ones that we just, uh, you could have up to 50 cases set at a time prior to the pandemic, um, it's, uh, it, it's for a hearing to determine if uh, an individual has assets in which to pay a judgment and our collection agencies were in the habit of setting those and uh, a lot of those were taken care of before hearings, but uh, then we'd have, you never knew. Sometimes you'd have a lot of people show up, sometimes you'd have very few. We, we did continue those things out, but uh, we came to a resolution on that limiting the number of every uh, so many settings every 15 minutes it used to be 30 minutes now it's 15 minutes and that backlog's gone now on those civil collection order show causes um, otherwise uh, we've been operating on small claims uh, forcible entry and detainer protection orders all of that is uh, up to date and timely madam chair any follow-up judge, for Judge Christensen or Judge Wilkins on the backlog or lack thereof? All right, thank you. Any further, Representative Gray? You're good? Okay, back to you. Um, committee, just for, it is 10.03, seeing some of you have um, stepped out for a minute. Would you like a break or wanna continue with this segment, a, a break? Uh, Chief Justice, if you um, could just hold your presentation there while we take a 
quick break and come back. So let's take a 10 minute break in reality. Um, so we'll come back at, or seven minutes. We'll come back at 10, 10, 10, 10. I get to bill point two for that. <laughs>
Okay, committee, I see that most of us are back. Wonderful. We'll call the meeting back to order. Chief Justice Davis, good to see you. Uh, feel free to begin when you're ready. I think I'm ready. Um, just one point on the um, email filing rule and rule four, the transmit language. Um, that rule is not effective until December 7th. And so if you have questions about that, you may want to contact your friendly local um, attorney uh, on the uh, civil rules committee and, and uh, see what the thinking was on that. If there's, there's an issue with it, it could be modified if that's warranted um, before the effective date. So with that, I would move on then to court operations and I'll just confine myself to the Supreme Court. As far as the caseload at the Supreme Court goes, it's about what it was uh, before the pandemic. Um, we're an appellate court, so we don't have to worry about bringing in witnesses or jurors. Um, most of our work is with the record of the lower courts or administrative agencies. <clears throat> we have uh, since uh, May, been conducting oral arguments uh, with counsel um, by teams remotely uh, with minor adjustments to our processes as, as we've gone along. And I don't think much, if anything, has been lost in that process. Uh, attorneys who come from around the who come from around the state or from out of state generally prefer not to come to a live oral argument at our court. Our arguments are an hour each, so each lawyer gets to argue 30 minutes and um, we have had only the most minor of uh, glitches with uh, doing them remotely. Occasionally the internet for the attorney uh, will sort of momentarily go out and they have to leave and rejoin the argument, uh, which is probably disturbing to them, but uh, we stop the timer and, um, and let them have their full 30 minutes, even with the technological interruption. So um, as far as what's coming down the line, I don't know if I'm right, but uh, with the district courts um, ramping up their um, uh, jury trials, the, the pressure of that, of course, is as Judge Wilking pointed out, that's what moves cases to uh, pleas, is that it's it's one thing to sit there and, and wait, but when you're actually facing going into jury trial, that really stimulates plea and negotiations. And one of the options that's available is what's called a conditional plea which is where the defendant says, okay, um, I'll go ahead and plead guilty or no contest to uh, this case, uh, but I want to challenge the judge's ruling that my speedy trial rights have not been violated. And uh, so that exists in the rules and I expect maybe we'll see a number of cases where there are appeals of um, the, the uh, conditional, through a conditional plea of the time it took to get a case to trial. Uh, and we've actually seen a couple of those come through so far and I expect we'll see more. Uh, so we may actually get a little bump in caseload. In terms of management of the court, uh, most of our employees uh, have returned to work in the building. They're required to mask when not in their own work areas. And of course to stay home and report any COVID-19 uh, symptoms or uh, diagnosis if they're sick. Our building is open to the uh, public by appointment only uh, with the risks uh, posed by the pandemic. It's unadvisable to open the Judicial Learning Center, which is a great thing for the public. I don't know if you've visited it. It's got interactive exhibits, but you touch everything in there and it's actually kind of small. So that is for the moment shut down. Uh, those who need to use the law library may do so by appointment. Um, I don't know if the infection numbers continue to rise, if we'll continue with that, um, or if we have problems with users not following the rules to mask, except right when they're at the uh, terminals, that may change. The Supreme Court staff workload has increased overall as we've had to provide guidance to the district and circuit courts uh, with their assistance uh, during the pandemic and uh, support the lower courts with information they need in terms of training, uh, et cetera, PPE and cleaning supplies and, and providing a centralized repository for information about operations of all the courts on our website. 
<clears throat> it's all been done in cooperation with the conferences and it's gone very smoothly. Um, and before I turn this over to judges Wilking Christensen, I just wanted to say something about the efforts of the trial courts. As Judge Wilking uh, pointed out, some courts just closed when the pandemic began. Uh, they had no means to conduct proceedings remotely. As late as au late August of this year, I attended a meeting of the National Conference of Chief Justices, and there were states uh, which uh, had no equipment to allow remote hearings that late in the pandemic, and they were only semi-operational. The trial courts of Wyoming, as Judge Wilking pointed out, were never closed. They were able to keep operating by using remote technology from day to day, because coincidentally, we already had it. And each and every district and circuit judge has had to make decisions about how to keep court personnel safe, um, how to keep the attorneys, litigants, and the public safe during this time. Conditions vary uh, from court to court. Uh, and, and so do the uh, infection uh, conditions. And they've, they've done that often in the face of criticism from uh, local officials or uh, citizens. Uh, it, those who, some don't want any, any in-person activities, some want uh, more and uh, they've been caught in the middle and have had to walk a fine line. And I think they've done a wonderful job. I think they face perhaps the greatest challenge to can keep our courts functioning. The Wyoming judiciary has uh, seen at any time in our branches history, and they've done a, a remarkable job. I, I can speak for the Supreme Court when I say that we do not intend to make their jobs more difficult by adopting untested rules or attempting to impose additional obligations upon them in these challenging times unless they ask us to help them out with the rule. It's not a time for experimentation and I, I hope no one else feels the need to make their jobs any harder as long as this emergency continues. Unless there are questions, uh, Madam Chairman, I would uh, pass the baton to Judge Wilking. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, looks like we have a question from Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So last time I, uh listen to an oral argument in the court it was before COVID and, and it was still on the website and it was not archived. So I'm curious, are since COVID with the being moved to Teams, uh, is the streaming happening? Is it on YouTube? And also, is there been any more discussion about posting the archives rather than just doing a live stream of the Supreme Court oral arguments? Thanks. Uh, Justice? Madam Chairman, Representative Gray, we are streaming the audio uh, at this point in time. Um, I guess part of the reason for that is uh, it's simple. Another reason is it's not terribly exciting to see somebody standing at a podium um, making a dull argument um, uh, you know, on something like the rule against perpetuity. So I haven't received a high demand to go to a uh, video argument. We have done things uh, uh, by video. We've had two robing ceremonies and one bar admission ceremony where we did allow a few people into the courtroom and we did that uh, with streaming through a video. And so it's possible, but it takes a lot of work for the kind of interest level we get. With regard to archiving the oral argument, um, I think that's something we would like to get to uh, and have been wanting to get to for some time, but it's just that with all of the things going on with electronic filing and everything else um, there hasn't we haven't had enough staff to uh, set that up yet um, but um, it's in it's in the plan and eventually we will and um, if there was any great interest in, uh, expressed in having a, a oral arguments uh, provided by video it's something we could look into because we actually know how to uh, broadcast proceedings Any follow-up, Representative Gray? I don't see anyone else has any additional questions. Committee, uh, Clerk Wood um, has joined us. And so on the topic of email filing and those rules, and then I'd um, like to hear from her now, and then we'll dispose of that topic for the morning. So Clerk Wood, um, welcome. If you'd introduce yourself again for the committee, and um, I know you have some comments about the testimony you heard this morning and some questions might come from the committee. Good morning, I'm Tina Wood. I'm the clerk of district court in Crook County, Sundance. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Chairman Nethercott and uh, Co-Chairman. Um, and uh, I would just like to address the committee regarding some of the comments and questions that were brought up this morning regarding the e-filing or e-mail filing. Um, one of the question was about the uh, cost of emailing documents back to attorneys or parties. And yes, the rules do, uh, and they have had been in place to, uh, for the clerks of district court or the circuit court clerks to email or fax back to parties um, at the cost of a dollar per page. That did not change in the current rule, uh, but I, I do want to clarify that the only time we do, or I, I shouldn't say that because I do have a, a disclaimer at the end, would be as to if it was requested to be emailed or faxed back to someone that we would charge. It's not an automatic that we would uh, automatically fax or email back. My disclaimer is, is some of the counties have been emailing or faxing, probably more emailing nowadays, um, the first page or documents. So I'm going to make that disclaimer that they may be doing that already at no charge based upon the court orders that are in place and the, and, uh, the COVID uh, restrictions. So um, again, it's not an automatic process. We would have to be asked to do that. Most of the counties, I believe, are still charging, but again, there is the disclaimer. Um, I want to address the 50-page limit. Um, some of the counties uh, systems that uh, accept uh, the emails are not able to handle the or design to accept large documents. And so they may not get through the firewalls or what have you. So we compromised with the 50 page limit to, um, to address those uh, issues that we would have on our county level to uh, accept those large documents. And if it was something that was larger, a document that was larger than what our systems will allow through our firewalls, therefore the need for the phone call. Um, I would also like to address the um, issue about the e-filing system being placed on top of the uh, uh, new case management system. Um, when that was initially discussed with us and the Supreme Court, uh, we wanted time to make sure that the system, new system was uh, functional before we added another layer on top of it. Um, that was our request versus waiting for all of the counties to go on. So I just wanted to make that clarification that it was, you know, we just wanted to make sure that our case management system was functional because as we know with any system that there are a lot of issues that can go along with that. So we wanted to make sure it was, uh, we're not adding more headaches to the counties um, and the district court clerks than was necessary. Thank you. Question of the clerk? Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Clerkwood, thanks for coming in. I, I guess on the 50 pages, I mean, the way it's worded, it allows a rejection once the call is made. So, I mean, is the plan to just say, okay, if it's 75 pages, please send one that's 49 pages maybe, and then one that's 26 or whatever the cap is, you know, that is that, is that because the way it's worded, it allows for a rejection. And I guess, you know, the other question I'd have on sending a file back, I mean, it's already, I can understand a little more the, the way it's worded for sending it, but once it's printed, isn't it there, it's printed, so you're just scanning it. I mean, that, to me, the, the sending back, I mean, it's a little, a, a little bit odd. Um, so those are two of my questions. Thank you. Clerk Wood. Madam Co-Chair, Representative Gray. Um, as far as the 50 page, uh, that is uh, one of the larger counties that uh, had asked and, and for that because apparently their system was not able to. Um, 
so I, I really not sure exactly if it's is 51 pages. Uh, you know, I think there's room to wiggle there as far as that. Uh, I think it's just the main concern that uh, that we are made aware that there's this large document coming. And so we are, you know, in case it gets out there in your spam or it doesn't go through, that there's some kind of notification to the um, to the uh, clerk that there is is a, a large document coming. Um, and then if there are issues with the firewall that we have to figure out how to get that document through. And I don't think I got your first question. I'm sorry. Follow up representative. Thanks, Madam Chairman. Uh, Kirkwood, could you just expand on why? I mean, I understand. So you confirm that that is what the intention was, that the intent was the way it was worded. Um, but why sending a file to someone would be a dollar? I mean, I because it's already printed at that point. I mean, it, 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 you have the physical copy, so you're just scanning it. I, I suppose you don't want to have the scan on your files, I guess, for security reasons. But you know, it was said that when when it's emailed, it's immediately printed, and so you know you have the physical copy. You're just scanning it. So why would the fee be identical? I guess is my question. Clerk Wood, Madam Co-Chair, Representative Gray, I believe because the rules had that prior to, but again. Uh, you're right, we do have to print it out. We do have to put the file stamp on it and then we have to scan it back in. So it would be a document that that is available. Um, I'm just gonna go with that it was in the rules prior to the pandemic and it just continued through the process. Clerk Wood, uh, question. Do you know if any of the clerks have sought out any kind of CARES Act funding or um, to obtain the ability to do a electronic filing mark? Rep or excuse me, uh, Madam Co-Chairman, no, I don't believe they, I, well, I shouldn't say that. I think there was a couple of them that looked into it uh, as far as the um, possibility like of Adobe, because I think they have a, a timestamp or something on it, um, but the cost was prohibitive. Uh, but I don't believe that anyone, to my knowledge, has sought COVID um, funds to secure that. All right, any additional questions for the clerk? For clarity, Clerk Wood, Right, his before COVID and the temporary orders, when a, a lawyer would mail in or hand deliver documents into your court um, for filing and you'd receive the paper copy, would you then scan that document into some system? Yes, we, uh, Matt, excuse me, Madam Co-Chair, yes, I would. And so is the court maintaining an electronic system of some kind as a result of scanning in those documents? No. So where does the document go? What's in scanned? It goes in, oh, excuse me. It goes into our Y user program and it's stored on the Y user program. And then um, the, um, the images is, if it's, um, I'm sorry, I, I'm totally, if you could repeat your question, I am so sorry. Sure. When you receive paper pleadings to be filed in the court, like so I hand deliver it to you, you stamp it. Is it then scanned in by the court, by the clerk to a system? You scan it in anywhere? Yes, Madam Co-Chair. Yes, it is. It's scanned into Y user and then it's placed in our actual court file. When you print, when one is email filed to you and then the need to print it off happens, where does the hard copy go? Where does the paper version go? It goes in our, excuse me, Madam Co-Chair, it goes in our actual court file. The district court is not a paperless court, so therefore we have to maintain our court file. And is the paper file mainly for the public's use or do the judges use that paper file or are they using Y user? 
Madam Co-Chair, it's a combination of all of those. Thank you, Clerk Wood. Any additional questions for Clerk Wood? Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, appreciate it. All right, back to Chief Justice Davis. I, Welcome back. Welcome Madam back, Chairman. I think I'd concluded and I was just going to, I think everybody's tired of listening to me. I was going to pass it off to uh, Judge Wilking uh, if that uh, suits the chair. Wonderful. Any final questions for the Chief Justice Committee? All right, seeing none, we'll move to Judge Wilking. Welcome back, Judge Wilking. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Nethercott, Representative Kirkbride, uh, members of the committee. I'm Catherine Wilking, and I'm a, a district court judge in Natrona County and uh, the newly elected chair of the district court conference. And I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you this morning about uh, what's going on in the district courts. Um, I've said it before, but it does bear repeating uh, because I think it's a pretty incredible uh, accomplishment that um, since the beginning of the pandemic, the district courts uh, have remained open. And um, the chief is right, not very many courts can say that. Uh, at all. Uh, in other states, courts were closed for a significant period of time. Uh, but in Wyoming, uh, even if at times the physical uh, buildings were temporarily closed to the public, um, I can assure you that the district court judges were there. Uh, and at some times, they uh, were the only person uh, in their courthouse, uh, but they were there uh, doing the work that they needed to do. I have never been prouder uh, to be a member of the district court conference. I am proud of all of my colleagues uh, and their staff. It is worth remembering that a judge has a very small staff in the district court. It's the judge, a judicial assistant, a court reporter, and a law clerk. Uh, so it's four people uh, that make up a district court staff. Um, as to judicial assistants, um, I cannot praise them enough for their work uh, during this difficult time. Uh, the attorneys on the committee, you know, it used to be uh, that a judicial assistant would set a hearing, they would type up a notice of setting and mail it to counsel uh, and the parties. And that was that. Uh, today, uh, when you set a hearing via Microsoft Teams, uh, the judicial assistants are required to do much, much more than that. Uh, they now have to gather email addresses and phone numbers for all of the hearing participants in either a hearing or a trial and send invitations uh, to them with instructions about how to use Microsoft Teams. Uh, you know, juvenile hearings, I think it was mentioned by the chief, uh, they can have 10 to 15 participants for one case. And criminal cases can have even more than that. Uh, so in a typical week, uh, one morning, I'll have at least four juvenile hearings. Uh, so if we have 10 to 15 participants in each of those hearings, my judicial assistant is sending invitations to at times over 50 people just for one little hour of juvenile court hearings. Uh, and in criminal cases, it's even more than that. Uh, they also uh, have to set up and have routinely uh, set up tutorials uh, outside of the hearing time uh, where they can do a test run with pro se litigants or even attorneys, maybe who are not so technologically savvy uh, to make sure that they can participate uh, in the court hearings. And uh, the chief mentioned the digital divide. Uh, our judicial assistants have gone above and beyond uh, to accommodate individuals who can't bridge that digital divide, who do not have a device or internet access or minutes on their phone. Our judicial assistants have made sure that there is a place for those individuals to go to so they can interact with the court um, via uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, our court reporters are incredible. Uh, many of them have uh, school-aged children 
And when the schools were closed for a period of time uh, during the early days of the pandemic, many of our court reporters were working from home, uh, reporting uh, court hearings and trials. Uh, and uh, even though I know it's their preference to always report with everybody in the room, uh, they have mastered uh, Microsoft Teams and uh, I'm sure you can imagine how difficult it is to report proceedings uh, on that platform, but all of them have done a fantastic job and really now they just make it look easy. Um, the law clerks and the staff attorneys, um, in addition to their normal research and writing duties, uh, many of them are assisting the trial courts by sanitizing courtrooms uh, during our trials. They are wiping down witness chairs, uh, cleaning them. Uh, one judge even told me that before he got his technology upgrade to his sound system, uh, when he was going through jury selection, uh, his law clerk had a portable microphone on the end of a very long, long no, stick I'm, I'm, I'm cool with and you. would go and put that microphone in front of uh, jurors' mouths so that everybody could hear them uh, during jury selection. Uh, it is a small staff of essential workers uh, and across the state, they are doing a tremendous amount of work uh, in very, very stressful times. Uh, we all have to constantly adapt and adjust and frankly do whatever it takes uh, to keep the courts operating. Uh, at times this can be surreal. Uh, in order to restart the jury trials, as I mentioned, we all had to reconfigure our courtrooms. Uh, and at one time I found myself sitting in the audience portion of uh, our largest courtroom with two measuring tapes to my nose uh, with six feet going out uh, to make sure that we could adequately space our jurors. Uh, it's my staff um, there with me that whole time uh, going through that process. Uh, we recently received a box of Lysol and you would have thought it was uh, Christmas morning, uh, the way that we were so excited. We had what we needed uh, to keep things clean. These are not things that one would normally associate uh, with the work of the courts, but I continue to be impressed with uh, all of the people uh, on this four person team uh, that make up the district courts. And I just want you to understand that they are public servants in every sense of that word. And it is a distinct privilege to work with them. And I know that all of my colleagues feel the same way. They have stepped up to the plate uh, in incredible ways and done an incredible amount of work uh, just to keep us going. So I thank them for that. Um, I've gone through kind of how we're doing jury trials, so I won't belabor that point. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you might have about that. I will say I've outlined how Natrona County does it. Um, other courts maybe don't have that same setup and have had to be more creative. Uh, Judge Blumel told me that he's uh, scheduled jury trials at the South Lincoln Training Center uh, in Lincoln County, and he's actually conducted two trials at the Roundhouse uh, in Uinta County. So um, different judges in different jurisdictions have to address things uh, as their community um, needs arise. Um, I did mention as well that the safety of all of the participants uh, in courtroom settings and in jury trials is our number one priority. And the safety protocols um, have already proven um, themselves. Uh, my colleague, Judge Forgey, had an eight day jury trial uh, earlier this month, and uh, the jury had been impaneled on day two of the trial. Um, one of the jurors called from the parking lot and said, I've just discovered that I was in a car last week with someone who tested positive. Uh, Judge Forgey, of course, excused uh, that juror from further participation and some alternates uh, were used. He called the health department uh, to get their advice about what should occur uh, given that juror's disclosure. 
And the health department advised that since we had social distancing in place, since we required masks and there were other screening protocols in place, there was no danger to the rest of the trial participants and he could proceed with the trial. He was able to do that and a verdict was reached, uh, like I said, after eight days. It has been very humbling uh, for us to know that there is much that we cannot control uh, during this period of time. Um, judges have a hard time not controlling things, but I think um, all of my colleagues have been humbled um, by what is out of our control. Uh, with the numbers uh, that are rising within the state and at various levels throughout the different counties, uh, each judge is monitoring their local communities. They are consulting regularly with local health officials to decide whether or not a jury trial can safely occur at a certain point in time. The sixth order from the Supreme Court specifically provides that a district court uh, judge and a circuit court judge uh, in his or her discretion can determine uh, whether or not the conditions of their courthouse and their community um, and their community's current health permit uh, the safe conduct of a jury trial. And um, so if it is deemed to be safe, the jury trial can proceed. If not, then the matter may be continued. I was scheduled for a jury trial at the end of September and I had to continue it. I had scheduled to begin next week. Uh, because one of the attorneys uh, that was in the case had a positive uh, in their office. Uh, so we couldn't do the trial at that time and simply moved it. Much has been said about the equipment um, and I won't belabor that point, but I do want to express our conference's sincere gratitude for the funds that were allocated um, by the legislature so that we could get that equipment. Uh, we absolutely could not do the work that we're doing without it. Uh, it is invaluable and uh, we just thank you so much uh, for giving us what we need. Um, the Supreme Court, uh, the Circuit Court and the District Courts have all worked uh, very cooperatively during this period of time. Uh, the chairs of the District and the Circuit Court Conference meet uh, with the Supreme Court weekly. And those meetings have been especially uh, important. I want to thank uh, Chief Justice Davis and Justice Fox. They have been uh, very receptive and very responsive to the needs of the district court and they've issued orders that provide the necessary flexibility to accommodate the different needs of our different communities and they have made sure that we have all of the PPE uh, that we need and so I appreciate their efforts. Um, my conference is very aware of the state budget crisis. Uh, we have proposed cuts to each of our budgets uh, and uh, we also have agreed or offered to take on the work of the newly formed uh, Chancery Court. Uh, that piece of the puzzle will require some legislative uh, action uh, if they want to take us up on that. Uh, I think they do. Um, if approved, uh, we do estimate that us taking on the work of the Chancery Court would uh, save approximately $900,000. Uh, and when the state uh, gets on a better fiscal footing than the Chancery Court as uh, originally envisioned could go forward. Uh, we've offered to take that on uh, at a time when we are extremely busy. Uh, the workload studies show that the third, the sixth and the seventh judicial district uh, all need a fourth judge. We certainly are not currently asking for that, um, but it is worth remembering uh, that the need is still there and the need will uh, likely actually grow uh, as the fallout from the pandemic uh, makes its way inevitably uh, to the courts. Uh, Chairman Nethercott and uh, Representative Kirkbride, I'm very sensitive to your schedule uh, and what you have on uh, your plate for today. So there are other uh, matters that I could address. They're rather dry. Uh, so I have uh, prepared a more extensive written report uh, that I will submit to the committee uh, in accordance with our conference rules. Um, I'll have that to you uh, before November 1st and I'm happy to follow up with any of you on those more dry matters uh, at a later time. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions that folks might have. Thank you.
Wonderful, Judge Wilking. We look forward to receiving that report and we really appreciate your, your presence here this morning. Questions for Judge Wilking? Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And thanks, Judge Wilking, for uh, being here today. I really appreciate the uh, thorough updates from the judiciary. Um, so this Chancery Court proposal, I hadn't heard that before, and there's been a lot of, uh, including, you know, I, I've been in this, I, I, the implementation of the Chancery Court, I think, turned out to be way more, way more expensive than uh, we ever thought uh, when that was voted on in, in, I think, 2019. So what would be the workload? I, I, I suppose that it appeared that there isn't going to be another judge hired workload across the conference, I, I assume, probably staying away from the three that already are at the cap or pretty close to or at above what what the target was in the workload study. Is that basically what it would look like? Or with certain judges, would it be two or three or would it be just spread out across all the ones that um, how would that look? Thank you. I'm going to just inter intervene here, um, Judge Welking. So at our last meeting committee, you may recall Lily Sharp of the court talking with us briefly about this. At that time, I had proposed to the court um, to work together with the district court judges conference to help provide us this idea and potentially a bill draft. That was to, that offer to work with the judiciary committee at that time was declined, primarily as a result of I think timing and kind of uncertain. Um, direction to be taken. And so what has happened is the blockchain task force, the digital innovation task force is taking that issue up. They will hear that next Monday at their committee meeting. Um, that committee actually has more lawyers on it than this one does, including um, private practitioners um, that serve on the Chancery Courts, um, the bars committee associated with that. So we will receive that, um, those bill drafts in the event they come out of that committee in the 2021 session. Um, so just, just for the committee to have that, uh, those drafts are currently being worked on by LSO as we speak uh, in my inbox for review. Um, so that's the logistics legislatively concerning that particular topic. But Judge Wilking, I'm excited to hear from you on it. Uh, Chairman of the Cut, uh, Representative Gray, thank you. Uh, as, as I understand it, and I, and I uh, am not an expert on uh, all things Chancery Court, but the original legislation did provide for uh, personnel um, for the court. So a judge would be hired, a judicial assistant, um, support staff, and then um, obviously there would be an actual physical uh, building uh, that would house the Chancery Court. Uh, what we're proposing and offering to do is to not have those positions filled uh, right now uh, and that the uh, district court conference, I, I believe in consultation with the Supreme Court, would um, come up with a, a group of district court judges that uh, would be uh, well suited to perform um, the work of the Chancery Court judge. Um, you know, it's that court is a, a business litigation. Um, that's its whole goal is to have timely resolution of um, business disputes in Wyoming. Uh, and I think that's very attractive uh, for certain uh, companies. And so there, there are judges within our conference who would have a much better comfort level with that than others. And so there would be a group of district court judges that would do the work of the Chancery Court. They would do that within their own courtrooms uh, with the use of their support staff. As far as numbers and what that might mean, I can't speak to that. Uh, I think it's in its infancy and we don't know how many cases would be filed within the Chancery Court. Um, uh, I think um, Senator Nethercott can maybe uh, give a better guess of what that might be, but that is the proposal right now uh, for a portion of our conference to take that on. While they're doing that work, it may be that other members of our conference would have to step in and take up their day-to-day -day work uh, while they're doing the work for the Chancery Court. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Judge Wilking. Any follow-up? Okay, seeing none. 
Um, Judge Christensen, would you like to provide any comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Brian Christensen, President of the Circuit Court Judges Conference, uh, Chairwoman Nethercott, Co-Chair Kirkbride, and members of the committee. Um, I think a lot of things that I was going to say have been covered a lot better than I would have done by Judge Wilking. I just wanted to hit a few points or add to um, that uh, we do oversee uh, other personnel through the circuit courts, our circuit court clerks. They were deemed essential personnel, of course. And while most people were at home in the time period, they were here. Even when we uh, would have allowed some time off for them, they were here. And uh, uh, also very impressed with the uh, people and the commitment of the uh, workers and the employees of the state of Wyoming and, and uh, specifically as to our circuit court clerks. Um, as to a uh, few other points as to technology uh, that looking over my notes, we didn't get, I uh, didn't bring up before. And I think I've mentioned this before when uh, we have had almost every week a uh, warrant issued in another county, uh, we're able to hold an arraignment in, from that other uh, county's jail uh, that saves days on an individual being incarcerated and having to be brought back to here for Natrona County or wherever they, their warrant was issued uh, and allows us to do that arraignment, um, video uh, arraignment uh, from our location while they're in the, uh, the other county's jail. It's worked out very well. And uh, um, the other thing about the technology, all our law enforcement requests in the Toronto County for search warrants are now obtained electronically. We do not see the law enforcement in person um, as they are one of the highest susceptible classes of individuals that uh, may uh, access or have COVID. Um, but we've been doing that electronically just like uh, you would a DUI blood warrant, um, swear them in by, uh, and have it recorded or by uh, swearing in and having it sent uh, email or by electronic means, faxing, whatever. Um, the CARES funding technology also included access at our uh, attorney tables that allowed for them to plug directly into the system to allow them to uh, show uh, evidence and exhibits, uh, which was talked about by Chief Davis and not being uh, handling exhibits and passing them around. And now with more and more law enforcement agencies using dash cams and body cams, uh, that evidence is easily displayed to a jury instead of in the old days when we had somebody using a private uh, laptop uh, and everybody was supposed to see the small screen on the laptop. So it's been immensely a, a better operation. As to caseload, I can't say our caseload's any different. We, we are as busy as we ever were um, from uh, prior to the pandemic. And, uh, but, and that isn't from backload. And uh, I just had a note here about with our staff also, we've had to modify their working areas uh, when moving around, having to wear their mask and put up plexiglass and those things and set up a quicker drop box for litigants to uh, um, drop off uh, legal forms to be filed in the circuit courts instead of actually coming to the windows to be waited on by clerks. So a lot of efficiencies and a lot of uh, COVID related um, concern, uh, new activities have been implemented to um, address the situation we're in. But uh, I think it suffice it to say we are all open and operational with the due regard to the COVID concerns. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Judge Christensen. Questions for Judge Christensen? Uh, Representative Stith. Uh, Madam Chairman, Judge Christensen, I had a question. Uh, it seems to me that it could be very difficult for the judicial branch to make 10% budget cuts because so many of your costs are just fixed. Um, is Would it make sense to give the Supreme Court or somebody authority to perhaps eliminate excess circuit court magistrate positions if such exist. Judge Christian. Uh, Chairman, Chairman Nethercott, uh, Representative Stith, thank you for, it was on my notes to bring this up. We have um, 
uh, as a conference, um, uh, uh, part of our budget cuts was to get rid of our part-time magistrates because we were able to hold hearings for each other uh, by video technology now. Um, we uh, are no longer using um, part-time magistrates in our communities. We're using circuit court judges to cover hearings when individuals are on vacation or ill or have some conflict. Um, and that I've seen that through our emails uh, every week, um, uh, who can cover this or what and everything. It's been overwhelming all our, our uh, brethren on the courts here uh, have uh, covered for each other. And I haven't heard of anything uh, not being able to be covered. Additional questions, follow up representative. All right, with that, I think we're about to wrap out this topic. Any final questions from the committee of the judges <clears throat> or chief justice, representative Gray? Yeah, I, I this is a question for, uh, I think, you actually um so the chancery court plan would that be to what would happen to the idea for a physical space would it be just roving in the district court space uh what is the the way the bill draft i mean i i just got it so representative gray yes that is the plan i think there's some challenges associated with the decision of the state building commission um, to move forward with the Casper office building. And that's kind of in a halfway point, um, but it may be an issue of, um, you know, stopping the bleeding essentially, but the contemplation with that bill dropped originally um, from my understanding of it and as a co-sponsor was that there was never going to need for a physical space. Um, and so uh, transitioning to having the district court judges do it why their courtrooms cannot be available if physical space is necessary, uh, why that can't be effectuated, you know, I don't, I don't know why that can't be. So of note with these chancery courts, they, they are courts of business disputes and um, they're not really trial courts. So very often these, these types of disputes will be resolved through motions practices. Um, through the attorney's, attorney's work. So similar to what you see in the Supreme Court with oral argument, there's not a great need to call juries and have big presentations of evidence concerning these litigation disputes. That's not to say that jury trials may not occur, but that's really not their intention. And thus their speedy uh, disposition um, associated with them. So the need for the physical space, you know, there was a lot of confusion about that after that bill passed and frustration, I think, from many members of the legislature fairly about how and when that occurred. All right. Transitioning, it looks like we have Ms. Sharp, our state court administrator here standing by. She's on our agenda. I think we had some introduction of bill drafts. Um, Also on our agenda, Ms. Sharp, are you available? Mr. Fuller? Chairman Nethercott, um, just two quick notes. That was the introduction of bill drafts was just in case the committee took up the three bill drafts you mentioned earlier, um, which I understood would be um, just left for um, individual sponsorship if needed. And I also want to know that Chairman Kirkbride had his um, blue hand up at one point. Oh, I didn't see that. Um, Co-Chairman Kirkbride, my apologies. It's not appearing on your images like it used to do that. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Madam Co-Chairman. I just had some editorial comments to make that weren't exactly essential, but I, I thought what Judge Wilking talked about, about the four man teams as a non-attorney, that, that was very helpful. I'd never heard that before. So I wanted to thank her for that. I want to congratulate Judge Christensen on his appointment as president for life of the circuit uh, judge conference. <laughs> Uh, he's been doing that the whole time that I, I have been here and uh, he will continue. And, and I just uh, heard the theme all morning about that uh, some of the technology that's been kind of forced upon the courts in the last six months, I think will be very valuable going forward. And uh, as the legislature learns how to operate with no money, but I saw, I think it's, it's uh, 
than a sheep in wolf's clothing. There'll be some uh, great value to some of that uh, innovation that came upon us since March 15th. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chairman. Yeah, so committee members, if you wanna get my attention, I, I like that raised hand function, but for whatever reason, um, this time around, it usually appears up in the upper right corner of your image so I can both see that and then see it in the participant list. So um, for now, we'll have to physically raise your hand to, it's for me to see that fairly clearly. Um, sorry about that. So Ms. Sharp, you're on mute right now. Good morning, Chairman. Uh, it's real, and good morning, members of the committee. It's very, very nice to see you all again today. I just had a couple things to add. First, uh, just to remind you that on that, the fee that is charged for, e for email e-filing, um, first, it's our understanding that the circuit courts do not charge when they're asked to email a document back to the attorneys. And the second is that the filing or that that, that fee for the counties, um, in, in, so in circuit court, that fee that's charged goes to the actually goes to the general fund, to the state general fund. For the district court, that those those fees go to the county. And that's my understanding why the, especially if, for example, Crook County wants that fee is because it helps to pay for the for the operations of the county. Then there's just one other um, the one other thing I wanted to point out, and this is for um, Representative Gray. Representative Gray, those COVID funds they we one of the requirements for the COVID funds is that they can only be spent on items that were not budgeted in the last budget bill so the none of those COVID funds could be spent to actually uh, replace our operating expenses and so that is why we were able to buy all this new technology is because the technology hadn't been funded and that's all, Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Sharp. Appreciate that. Any questions, Representative Gray? Thanks, Ms. Sharp. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Ms. Sharp, uh, I, I had a question that was a little different. I, I'm not sure that was when I really asked that, but um, I, I did have a question on the transportation costs. We saw from Judge Wilking, she talked a little bit about transportation costs. Uh, that, that had been saved. We've heard that from corrections in the context of telehealth. I think in terms of uh, effectuating budget reductions out of COVID, you know, transportation costs should be one of the first things thought about. And I understand that moving forward, you know, the, it, it could go closer to the way it was originally. And, and, and that's a, a, a discussion to make. But in terms of effectuating reductions in transportation costs, as long as we're in this current state that we're in, uh, what has been the conversations with the executive branch and the Joint Appropriations Committee on that? Thank you. Ms. Sharp. Um, Chairman Nethercott and Representative Gray, do you mean transportation for, for our judges and our justices? No, I think it was more uh, to, to hearings, I think, was the context that Judge Wilking was using. So, for example, we heard from corrections about four months ago about how, because they're doing telehealth, they don't need to, uh, uh, there, there's no transportation cost there. And I think Judge Wilking was saying that from a, from a hearing uh, and back, uh, that that transportation cost is no longer uh, there. So I, I think that was the context. I mean, I, I but any other areas where transportation costs would be saved. I mean, anything in the judiciary, I, I just from, from 30,000 feet up can see a lot. Well, I, and I, I can't speak for the uh, uh, chairman and representative Gray. I can't speak for the, the, the sheriff's offices or the, or DOC as to how, how much their transportation costs have decreased. Uh, but, but we did take cuts um, the judiciary has uh, provided the, the, uh, it, its new budget basically to the JAC and we, ha we did cut our, our transportation budget because again, we don't have any, really don't have any other places. We have very few places to cut because we only have um, almost 
all of our budget, well over 90% of our budget is, is just salaries. So we've, we've cut everywhere we can. Any follow up? All right, thank you, Ms. Sharp. Please continue. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Um, and I have no, I have nothing else unless you have all have questions. All right, seeing no further questions, Ms. Sharp, it's great to see you this morning. Um, committee, we will close out this particular um, item on our agenda. And now we're gonna to turn to our 11 o'clock. Looks like we're right about on time. Representative Stith. Madam Chairman, uh, just as uh, a comment on the set me free statute, I had moved to table that and the committee did table it in August, I believe. Uh, just to explain for the rest of the committee members, I think it's a topic that we need to sort out. Um, I had worked on trying to craft an amendment uh, that would make sense. And every time I tried to, I didn't really come up with anything that I thought was going to be workable in the short time frame. I think it is a topic about management of district courts with the purpose and goal of evening out the workload between the judges who are really, really busy and those who have a little extra time on their hands. I think that's a topic worth considering in, in the future, uh, but uh, not uh, today. And finally, just as a, as a comment, I agree with Justice Davis that, well, email filing is is a dead end. It's not just a dead end. It's under this rule, it's just dead. Uh, so there you have it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Stith. Representative Gray? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about what Representative Stith just said. You know, I, I think um, evening out the workload was an important thing. And I do want to say that, that that was a really important thing we heard about the Chancery Court in that respect. I mean, the fact that um, there are some judges who can take that on. And if you look at the workload study and, and they can, and if there's some that have that expertise and then their, their, uh, their workload could be filled by another as we heard from Judge Wilking. And I, I thought in that respect, that was a really good sign um, that, we, that we saw that. So anyway, I don't disagree with what Representative Stiff is saying, but I thought uh, in order to implement that change in the Chancery Court, they would have to be doing that to some extent. So I thought that was a good sign. Thank you. Okay, committee, with that, let's transition to our 11 o'clock item, the county attorney salaries. We have Aaron Wiseman, Teton County and Prosecuting Attorney, and Jeremiah Riemann here from the County Commissioners Association. We have both of them coming in. I see Ms. Wiseman. Ms. Wiseman, welcome. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair and uh, Co-Chair Kirkbride and committee members. If you could introduce yourself to the committee and go ahead and proceed. Thank you very much, uh, members of the committee. And again, Madam Co-Chair and Co-Chair Kirkbride. My name is Erin Wiseman. I am the Teton County and Prosecuting Attorney here in Jackson, Wyoming. Uh, first, I want to thank you all for your continued uh, consideration and discussion of uh, this matter, which uh, the committee took up as your interim topic number two. This is now the third time that I have appeared before all of you and I, I I'm so appreciative of the time that the committee is taking on this. The proposed draft bill, which is in front of the committee today, is to amend Wyoming Statute 183107. Uh, LSO prepared based upon the action taken at your last meeting in August, working draft 211, and that is with respect to the county and prosecuting attorney's salaries. I would start by saying that after tuning in yesterday to the discussion with the district attorneys, and some of the county attorneys as you discussed budget cuts. Uh, I recognize the poor timing of this particular bill. However, my counterparts across the state highlighted, I believe to this committee, the vast cross-section of important cases and work which we do that encompasses uh, these offices which are an extension of the state of Wyoming. The work we do is a heavy and important responsibility to not only our constituents and the counties, but also to the state. This draft bill addresses the problems that counties are facing, not only Teton County, but at least six others and likely uh, eight in the near future, where deputy attorneys make significantly more than the elected official. 
as this uh, committee has heard me state before, I have uh, two chief deputies, which are at a salary range of 144,000 a year. And that step uh, increase goes up to 151,000. Those matrixes are put in place by the Board of County Commissioners. So I do not control those increases as they occur. However, this fiscal year, my deputy attorneys and staff will not see any increases based upon the budget cuts that are being undertaken. My newest deputies uh, make essentially uh, at or near $100,000. And this is significant to the disparity that is occurring in my offices and others across the state. This proposed bill would not automatically grant any increases in my salary or others. It would not go into effect until 2023, which is after the next election cycle. So not during this current term as the law requires. And the proposed bill achieves two things. Uh, first, and I think very important for this committee and the state is that it caps the state's fiscal liability to counties, uh, giving the state that maximum contribution cap of $50,000 or 50%, whichever is, uh, is less. And secondly, it allows each county the flexibility that is needed to set the salary for their elected county and prosecute an attorney. This is critically needed in at least six, if not eight counties who are at or near the maximum of $100,000 for their elected county prosecuting attorneys. Those six counties are Campbell, Carbon, Converse, Sheridan, Sweetwater, and Teton. The removal of this cap uh, changes essentially what is currently in place in the statute, creating a new subsection D, which again would go into effect uh, from and after January 1, 2023. Subsection C is what's currently in place, which links uh, the salaries to that authorized for district attorneys. This bill plans for the future, and I urge you to focus on what the bill does and that it allows counties to be nimble, to attract and retain solid, experienced, dedicated county and prosecuting attorneys who want to serve the public and want to run for office. The bill does not equate to raises and may not result in any raises for years to come. I know that each of you recognize and appreciate the impact that these offices have across so many sectors in our communities. The state, I believe, has a keen interest in allowing these counties, all of our counties, to attract the best possible attorneys to serve the public and to attempt to correct this inequity that's facing counties whereby deputies are paid significantly more than the elected county and prosecuting attorney who is running the office. I urge you to support draft bill 211 and I will stand for any questions that this committee has of me. Thank you, Madam Co-Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Wiseman. Questions for Ms. Wiseman? Representative Stiff. Madam Chairman, uh, Ms. Wiseman, thank you. And I, th I think you make uh, an interesting argument with respect to the peculiar situation of Teton County where cost of living is higher, uh, average pay is just higher than elsewhere in the state. And I think you make some case for a regional cost adjustment for Teton County. Uh, my question, however, relates to the bill itself. And it's bluntly, isn't it obvious that this bill is just unconstitutional if adopted because it violates Article 14, Section 3? Because if you have a bill that says that County attorneys will be paid no less than $35,000. The legislature is advocating its responsibility to actually fix the salaries of county officers. Ms. Wiseman. Thank you, Madam Co-Chairman and Co-Chairman Kirkbride, Representative Stiff. This is a question that certainly came up in the last hearing in August. And I recognize what you're pointing out in Article 14, Section 3 of the Wyoming State Constitution. However, I do believe, and it's one legal interpretation, that it is constitutional. Uh, and I would state to you that by way of subsection D, including that not less than $35,000, and then including a maximum cap contribution from the state, 
that the legislature is essentially setting the salary for the county prosecuting attorneys. Thank you, Ms. Wiseman. Any additional questions for Ms. Wiseman? All right, seeing none, Ms. Wiseman, thank you. I don't think we do have Mr. Riemann. Mr. Riemann, welcome. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee. I'm Jeremiah Riemann here on behalf of the Wyoming County uh, Commissioners Association. Appreciate uh, your time. Uh, we do continue uh, to support advancement of this concept of this bill. Uh, Ms. Wiseman has, uh, in this meeting and, and others, uh, discussed uh, the situation that we find ourselves in in a number of counties and the disparity that can uh, exist. I did want to make one comment uh, relative to uh, the balance that's struck in terms of the state contribution as well as the county uh, contribution. I know there was some conversation uh, last uh, uh, meeting about uh, perhaps uh, changing uh, that uh, state contribution in particular. And I want to uh, just note that there's no reduction uh, in terms of the state responsibilities that Ms. Wiseman and other county attorneys across the state uh, have. So uh, I would uh, ask that you avoid uh, changing. Uh, any sort of contribution level that the state has. As you can reference back to my presentation yesterday, uh, the budget situation that the counties find themselves in is just as challenging uh, as that that the state uh, currently uh, faces. Um, I know there may be some concern about uh, commissioners moving up uh, salaries. Um, and as the bill provides, the very earliest that any salary could change would be January 1st of 2023. Uh, but let's just be mindful of what uh, has happened during this uh, pandemic, during this period, as Ms. Wiseman stated, uh, her deputies were not uh, changed uh, in terms of their salary. And I'm not aware of any county uh, that gave uh, any bumps in salary uh, to its employees uh, during this period of time, uh, uh, you know, uh, with, uh, uh, with relationship to even those that were uh, adopted through resolution uh, and otherwise. So uh, with that, uh, again, we would support continued advancement of the concept uh, and I would stand for any questions. Representative Washett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Raymond, I guess I'm still struggling with this idea of if we pass this law, the changes couldn't go into effect until several years down the road. Why the rush to do it this year or not wait until the budget session? It seems to me that if we wait uh, another year, uh, we won't push that start date any further back and it, we'll have a better idea of where the economy is in the state of Wyoming, which would be advantageous for both the counties and the state to make wiser decisions down the road than to make them today. Madam Chairwoman, uh, Representative Washett, certainly that's one approach. Uh, we could kick uh, the can down the road to a different point in time. Uh, the reality is, uh, whether we pass it now or we pass it then, uh, the commissioners are going to have to consider uh, the sp specific circumstance that exists at that point in time of whether it's an appropriate uh, uh, action to make uh, in making uh, those adjustments. So. Uh, you're right, we could wait, uh, but, uh, but that certainly doesn't change the dynamics that uh, would exist on the ground uh, in terms of action in 2023 when it would be the earliest point that this could take effect. All right, any additional questions for Mr. Riemann? Mr. Riemann, thank you. Ms. Wiseman, thank you. Uh, stand by. We're going to go into introduction of the bill draft from LSO. And so anticipating additional questions that may come for after that, you may be necessary to answer some of those. So um, with that, we'll move to uh, Mr. Fuller or Mr. Hopkinson. Good to see you to present this bill draft. Thank you, Madam Ch uh, Chairman. David Hopkinson with the Legislative Service Office. Just here to present 21 LSO 211 working draft 
0.5 county attorney's salaries. Uh, this bill is, is fairly straightforward. It amends Wyoming statute 183107. We see that first amendment on page two in <clears throat> subparagraph C. Uh, the language there on 11 and 12 is simply clarifying that that, that, that section would not apply following um, December 31st, 2022. It creates a new subparagraph D, providing that after January 1st, 2023, and, and, and providing those limitations as provided by the, uh, the Constitution and statutory law, uh, to the extent permitted, that the salary should be not less than $35,000, uh, thus removing ultimately uh, the cap uh, of the salary being matched to that of a district attorney, uh, which is currently $100,000 a year. Uh, so it's simply lifting that cap. On page three, uh, the amendments on lines two through five uh, are simply putting in place a cap on what the state will contribute uh, to a county and prosecuting attorney's salary, in this case being a maximum of $50,000 or 50%, whichever is less. Uh, down at the bottom, it repeals in section two, uh, 183107A2B, which is simply language that is no longer uh, applicable uh, should this bill be passed. Uh, and it would have an effective date of July 1st, 2021. And with that, I would stand for any questions. Questions of Mr. Hopkinson, Representative Stith? Uh, Madam Chairman, Mr. Hopkinson, same question to you. Uh, have you had opportunity to look at the constitutionality of this proposed bill? Mr. Hopkinson? Uh, Madam Chairman, Representative Stith, I believe Mr. Fuller did want to comment on that particular issue. Mr. Fuller? Uh, Chairman Ellicott, Representative Stith, um, I'll try to share some clarity. With the caveat that ultimately, you know, it's up for this, it's up to this committee and the legislature to decide the constitutionality of a of legislation in the first instance. Back in the 1940s, there was a Supreme Court case that, in part, addressed um, a challenge under Article 14, Section 3. So, Section 1 um, states that. Um, officers shall be paid fixed and definite salaries and the legislature shall from time to time fix the amount of the salaries as are not already fixed by the constitution. Section three of article 14 says um, in part that um, that legislature shall from time to time fix the salary of count, salaries of county officers. And, and in this case, um, the, the Supreme Court noted that if the legislature sets a minimum and a maximum, leaving it to the municipality to fix the definite amount, um, that is sufficient. And the court called that an entirely reasonable conclusion. Um, certainly this bill draft is different in that the legislature would only be fixing the minimum. Um, so, so that would leave an open question whether um, in light of, you know, just fixing a minimum and leaving it to the municipality, to the, to the locality to fix the, the salary without a defined maximum, whether that would fit um, this provision. But I did wanna highlight there is that case um, out there that notes that in light of a minimum and maximum, fixing the definite amount um, would appear to, to pass constitutional muster um, if, if the current court relies on that case. Representative Stith, legal debate. Not to belabor the point, but Mr. F Mr. Madam Chairman, Mr. Fuller, um, the case of May versus Laramie from 1942 dealt with a situation where the legislature had fixed the maximum amount and the Supreme Court said that was sufficient. Is that correct? Chairman Othercott, Representative Stith, um, that is correct. The, the circumstances of that case were the legislature had fixed both a minimum and a maximum. And, and in that situation, the court did note that it was constitutional to leave it to the locality to ultimately fix the specific amount of salary um, for that position within the range. Um, you know, once again, this is, you know, a slightly different circumstance given 
um, you know, this legislation fixes a minimum um, and, and only a minimum. So it, it certainly could be, you know, the Supreme Court takes a different interpretation in light of that distinction. Um, but I did for the committee just want to highlight that case and um, and what the court has said in, in regards to those provisions of the Constitution. Rebuttal, Representative Stith? <laughs> uh, no, I, I apologize. I have my blue hand up by mistake if it's still up. All right. Any further questions of Mr. Hopkinson or Mr. Fuller? All right, committee. Uh, thank you both. Uh, any additional public comment available on this bill? Do we have anything? All right, thank you, Mary Beth. Appreciate that. All right, with that, public comment is closed. Uh, back to the committee. Committee, what's your pleasure? Move the bill. Moved by Senator Von Flater and seconded by Senator Cost. Discussion on the bill? Robust. Robust discussion on the bill. Seeing none and sensing you're ready for the question. Uh, Senator Ansomi Dalton, are you? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, the constitutional concerns um, are a problem for me. And I also think this is not the time, you know, then we get the sheriffs next and it, it rolls down and it's tricky. Um, I just think we're in COVID. Everyone's asking to cut their budgets. You know, I've expressed that concern the last time we we're back again. So I'll keep up with my same concern and uh, just wanted to address that. Thank you. Any further discussion? That always triggers more. Co-Chairman Kirkbride. Thank you, Madam Chairman. We've had that discussion in the past of whether this would reflect poorly on the legislature if they were to pass this bill in lean times. And to me, I don't think the political onus falls on the legislature. I think it falls on the, in this case, the Teton County commissioners if they want to raise the salaries. Uh, uh, back in time when I was a commissioner, one time we had the the weakest attorney in the county became the county attorney because of, among other things, uh, low salary. And you you don't want the weakest attorney in your county being your county attorney. So I'm going to vote in favor of this. And I think uh, in this unique situation in, in Teton and, and sounds like in some other counties coming up, it could be a value to have that option to be able to raise the salary uh, in a particular context. Thank you, Madam Co-Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chairman. Uh, Representative Pelkey. Uh, despite my uh, defense attorney's inclination to see uh, the underpaid prosecutors, I'm gonna vote in support of this bill. Um, I mean, it's just unrealistic at this point to see a prosecutor in, in of all places, Teton County, uh, making less than the deputies and trying to run an office efficiently. Um, and again, a, as Representative or Chairman Kirkbride mentioned, uh, the onus, and, and frankly, I don't care what the legislature looks like when we pass a bill like that, but the onus actually rests on the county commissioners. It's their decision. They're the ones to, to deal with their budgets. And I would urge uh, committee members to consider one, the efficacy of uh, an efficient and effective prosecution, and two, uh, that the ultimate decision lays with the county commissioners and not with us. Senator Cost. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, you know, I really believe in local control, and this gives or provides local control for the, the uh, county commissioners and allows them the option to be able to make those decisions. This decision does need to fall with them, and I think it's a, actually a, a reasonable bill for the counties to make that decision and pay what they feel is necessary in their county. We're putting in a part. We're not going to change that. It's not going to affect us. But if they choose to allow it to affect them, that's their choice. Thank you, Senator Cost. Any further comments? Discussion? Representative Stith? 
Madam Chairman, just briefly, with respect to the issue of local control, the framers of the Constitution made the judgment that this should not be a matter of local control. And there's a reason for that, because locally, the temptation to increase pay salaries is more uh, is is more difficult. It's more difficult for the county commissioners to say no than it is for the legislature to say no when it comes to pay increases. And the framers of the Constitution made the decision. If we want to amend the Constitution, that's one thing. But before we amend the Constitution, I think we should respect uh, what it says. In including the Laramie v. Manning case. <laughs> Question being called on the bill. Senator Boner, do you have comments? Oh, just brief. I just point out, I think we just heard from our LSO staffers that we're, the, the constitutionality of this bill is unclear. Um, so if there's a specific case that anybody wants to um, cite that uh, that, that uh, definitively says that somehow removing the maximum um, is unconstitutional, I'd love to hear it, but I haven't heard of that in two meetings. Uh, furthermore, I don't want to belabor the point, but we're, we're getting, uh, we're at a time of transition in the state where the state government cannot micromanage every last decision at the local level. We have to back off that. Maybe that uh, includes checking our egos at the door sometimes, but we need to let these uh, um, decisions be made at the local level where it's appropriate. There's a massive difference between Teton County, Niobrara, and Platte County, places like that. So I look at this as a broader trend that we're going to have to deal with in the legislature. Um, this is a very small part of that broader trend. Once again, if, if somebody's going to make the claim that this is unconstitutional, we might have to provide some evidence that that's the case. I think we just heard that uh, it could go either way. Thank you, Senator Boner. Committee, is there any concerns? So what we did here is that there is case, and I'm just trying to address these concerns and for discussion. We did hear that there is clear case law, Wyoming Supreme Court case law, identifying that the legislature does not have to put an actual amount, which you would think the constitution would require that, um, but they said it's perfectly lawful and constitutional to have a minimum and a maximum. So Representative Stith acknowledging that reality, are you considering an amendment to add a maximum? Madam Chairman, thank you for the, the invitation, uh, but I, I do not have an amendment to propose. I would just say, I think it's obvious that a minimum doesn't mean anything. And just merely having a minimum would be unlikely to pass constitutional muster in my view. Thank you. Is there an amendment for a maximum? Perhaps based on the district court judge's salaries? Which would be a maximum of $150,000. If we're interested in the constitutionality of our laws, one would think this would be an important topic for the Judiciary Committee to consider. Seeing there is no I'll make motion. That, Madam Chairman, I'll make that amendment. I'll move for that amendment. So moved by Senator Boner, seconded by Co-Chairman Nethercott. <laughs> All those in favor of making the question of the legality of this bill constitutional, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That motion has passed. Looks like there are all those opposed. Please raise your hand to placing a maximum cap in the bill. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That motion has failed. Or that the motion has passed. The amendment has passed. Point of order, point of order. It looked like there were eight there. It was it was one, two. Can we redo that? Let's do a roll call vote. Mary Beth, are you available for a roll call vote? Yes, ma'am. Sure. All those, all those in favor of Senator Boner's motion to put a statutory cap consistent with the district court judge's salary into the bill draft. Um, roll call vote, Mary Beth. Senator Rizal, 
Do. Senator Bowman. Aye. Senator Calls. Aye. Senator Bonsleyer. Senator Von Flater. Yes, aye. Representative Marlene? Aye. My mom. Representative Gray? No. Representative Jennings? No. Representative Thelma? Aye. Representative Paul Now. You know, I, I'm gonna, I'll go with yes. Representative Aye. Representative Salazar. No. Representative Stiff? No. Representative Washington? No. Co Chairman Kirkby? Aye. Mr. Chairman, Aye. Well, if if the Madam Chairwoman, it looks like that amendment passed. And could you say the the vote count? Six no. The rest are yes. Point, point of order. Point of order, Representative Stiff. Just, I. Uh, it was my understanding that for final, I guess this is just for the amendment, not for the bill. So Correct. Majority, majority of the whole committee survived. Okay. Yep, my we're apologies. just on the amendment. So now there's a statutory cap in the bill of $150,000. So now there's a minimum and maximum consistent with Wyoming Supreme Court pre precedent concerning the constitutionality of the bill. Solutions. All right, further discussion on the bill? Representative Pelkey? Uh, I'm curious, uh, depending on how we word that, are we putting in a hard $150,000 cap or are we making it commensurate with future increases in uh, district court judge salaries? Representative Pelkey, um, the motion I believe was consistent with district court judges' salaries. Right now, it's limited. The statutory reference, I believe, currently in law is to district attorneys. So that's okay. consistent. So now there's a minimum and a maximum for those two pieces. Thank you. Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Just want to comment a minute on my vote on that. You know, I think $150,000 cap is just way too high. I still think it's unconstitutional. Um, and uh, I think this bill, I'm gonna be voting no. I think it's really, uh, you know, you, you bring the constitutional issues, that's one thing, but there's also the issue of whether it's appropriate and right. And and uh, I'm a no on that. So uh, uh, I just think this is really, uh, yeah, it's, 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 to me, it's just pretty clear. It's just a no, thank you. For the discussion committee, all right, seeing none and sensing you're ready for the question, this is a roll call vote to adopt um, LSO Working Draft 211 version 0.5, um, County Attorney Salaries. Mary Beth? Senator Anselmi, no. No. Senator Bonner? Aye. Senator Cross? Senator Monsleyer? Aye. Representative Merlin? Representative Gray. No. Representative Jennings. No. Representative Powell. Aye. Representative Ponell. Aye. Representative Salazar. No. Representative Stiff. No. Representative Washington. No. Co-Chairman Kirkbride? Aye. Co-Chairman Aye. 
right, so that bill that, that does pass. I, Thank you. Just Thank to. You. Mr. Puller? Yeah, Chairman Othercott, by, by my count, I had five no's among the House members. And by this interim committee, by this committee's rules, uh, that motion fails. That bill has failed by virtue of the House. All right, thank you, Ms. Wiseman. Thank you, Mr. Riemann. All right, committee, we're a little early for lunch, but I think um, this presents a good time. Any additional discussion by the committee before we break for lunch? Seeing none, Representative Ponell. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh I had sent an uh, uh, email to uh, Co-Chairman Kirkbride that uh, I'll be leaving the, the meeting here uh, after or at lunchtime. So uh, uh, I just wanted to uh, say goodbye to everybody and uh, I've enjoyed working with you. Thank you. Representative Ponell, how many years have you been in the legislature? Well, I'm in my third term. The end of my third term six, uh, will be six years at the end of the year. Have you been on the Judiciary Committee for that whole time? Uh, on the on this committee the whole time and enjoyed it. So uh, I've enjoyed working with everybody. So I, I do appreciate it. Thank you. Your service has been invaluable, Representative Punnell. It's been a pleasure to serve with you. Representative if, I, if I may pitch in, uh, defense attorney, ex-hippie, and... Ex? And... <laughs> and uh and a sheriff uh we got along remarkably well and i have it's been an honor to serve with you my friend and uh i will miss you i hope i see you out there on the road and the beard looks good happy trail sheriff we will miss you representative burlingame Madam Chairwoman, I just wanted to say that getting to serve alongside Representative Pinal was such a pleasure and a surprise. And I would be remiss, as would the people of the great state of Wyoming, if we didn't ask him one last time to tell us whether he was for a bell or again it. <laughs> Representative Pinal, are you again it? <laughs> All right, any final comments from Representative Punnell, Senator Anselmi Dalton? Thank you. I just, um, though I, I've enjoyed working with you on judiciary, it's been fun and uh, sad to see you go. Um, and thanks for, you know, working with me on things we did and good luck. Thank you all. Uh, thanks again. Madam Co Co-Chairman. Co-Chairman Kirkbride. And I believe that uh, Representative Pinnell did 12 years as the Camel County Sheriff before he got here. So uh, that's quite a record. Public service is 18 years. You'll be missed, Representative Pinnell. You've served the state well. Enjoy your time in retirement. All right, committee, we'll come back at one o'clock for lunch. Enjoy your break. <laughs>